My name is Carl Blythe, and I'm the director of CORAL. That's how we pronounce it, CORAL, which stands for the Center for OER and Language Learning, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we have a, a large group of people here today, and I'm really excited by that. Um, and because we've got a, a, a really interesting workshop prepared to you, uh, prepared for you by Nina Wilson. Nina um, has a lot of experience in, in language teaching, and she has come to us now at the University of Texas. She's what we call a U Teach professor. U Teach is a program uh, in the College of Liberal Arts that focuses on training pre service teachers. And so Nina is in charge of our uh, foreign language teachers. And uh, today, of course, is going to be focusing on how to keep your students speaking, which of course is an enormous challenge now that we're moving to online remote education. Uh, how to keep them uh, engaged in within a proficiency framework. So um, let me just say that when after the workshop is over, if you will come back to our website and have a look around, we have uh, all kinds of uh, OER, that is resources, free resources for language teaching. Uh, this is, of course, funded by the federal government, the U.S. Department of Education. So I like to joke and say, you all are taxpayers, so you've already paid for all this stuff, so please use it. Okay, without further ado, let me get pass things over to Nina, and we'll get this workshop going. Nina, take it away. Good morning, everybody. It's really weird that I can't see you, um, but I know you're there because I see the number on the screen, and I've been scrolling through the names. Um, it is a honor and a privilege and it's very humbling to be here with you. I've already seen one of my favorite Spanish teachers on the list of names down there. Monica Mitre, I'm giving you a shout out. Thank you for being here. Um, so let me just warn you that this is going to be uh, very experiential. Um, this is not going to be a sit and listen. We're going to jump in and do lots of things together. I am only one teacher on this um, panel of 75 teachers it looks like right now which means that we have 75 different opportunities to get information from each other so my goal is for all of us to share what we have what we know our expertise our twist our creativity so that every single person leaves with something that they didn't come with but then that every single person is able to give something to someone else so that's just the premise right off the bat. Um, we are all going to be resident experts here and share our knowledge. I'm going to um, share with you some of the ways that um, I've been working with students and um, trying to adapt things to make it make sense online because I know that this is our, at least the foreseeable future, our newest reality that's coming up. And so if you have other things that you would like to share in there, I'm gonna, I'm telling you right now, we wanna hear it all. Um, we're gonna get started with just a bunch of the stuff that you need to do to make sure that things run smoothly. So I'm going to um, go over some groundwork before we jump in and I'll tell you, we're gonna jump in real quick um, and it's gonna go, uh, we're gonna we're gonna do the nesty plunge. I see there are teachers in this room like straight up because y'all are already playing with the features and the stuff and the things because I see things on the screen. I, and I don't know if I can get rid of that. Can you guys, y'all know how to get rid of the things that are there right now? The name and the y'all are writing on there. I love it. Um, so in the chat box, if you could give me A, B, C, and D right now, um, well, A, B, and C, and then it's just a number. So A is your name and where you're from, and then B, your favorite quarantine snack, and then C, what language and level you teach, and then on a scale of one to five, how are you right now? One being, you're lucky I'm up, it's nine o'clock, and there are no time level limits right now because you know, it's summer, or are you at five fantabulous, like, oh my gosh, this is my time, morning is when I, when I shine, so where are you right now? If you could put in the chat box those four pieces of information, I would appreciate that. Let me see if I can see the chat. Sweet, we got Houston in the house, cheese, <laughs> yogurt. <laughs> Oh, I love it. We have teachers. Yes, Nebraska. Ice cream. Oh, nice. Mixed nuts. Oh, man. I'm enjoying breakfast right now just through reading you guys' comments. Whatever your daughter bakes. Oh, my gosh. My daughter right now is um, 
a banana nut loaf expert because of COVID. Um, and that's been mine. French onion dip. She just discovered that yesterday. I love these. Sweet. Oh my gosh. Jerky. Oh, wow. We got all born in Japan. That's super cool. Almonds. That's one of mine. I love it. German in ESL. Nice. Okay. French. All the levels. Cookies. Yes. This makes me excited. All right. So we got UT in the house also. Peanut butter. <laughs> oh, these are making me laugh. I love it. Okay. Nice, nice, nice. Wow. Whoever that is, you type really fast because that was a lot of information that went by real fast. That was cool. All right. Keep going. Let's see. Ice cream. Okay. Ice cream, I think, may be the winner. That's the one I've seen the most. Sweet. Thank you for letting us know who's in the room and keep coming. We want to know who you are. Um, in order to make sure, keep it, keep it coming, y'all have to stop because I'm going to go back and read these two and we're going to potentially be talking about some of this information. So what you can expect, this is um, the three questions that I want your brain to focus in on as we engage in our day to day. So question number one, what are some strategies? that we can use that can get even our most shy students talking. So if we can reach the shyest kid, then we know that our verbose kid is taken care of too. So I want you to think about the strategies um, that you can take from the things that we share that would do what work for your shyest kid. I'm gonna ask also that as we're engaging that you have children in mind, that when we're doing these, that you think of particular kids that you teach or that you've taught and Think of the ones that were reluctant learners. Think of the ones that you have a hard time grabbing. And I want you to think of activities that you could use for them specifically. Because if you have a kid in mind, it helps to know which, which strategies um, you will want to take back to your practice. I'm aware that when I go to workshops, I never take every single thing because it doesn't mesh with my philosophy and what I need and what I'm looking for. So. I am excited when I can take one or two things. And my goal for you is that you will leave with at least one or two new things that you can take and make a permanent part of your practice, um, at least until best practices change. Um, the second thing, it goes right into that, is how can you decide if something is an effective proficiency building activity or practice or not? Um, and those are some things that I hope that um, you will question what we do and not just do it because it's fun or it's cute or it looks great or that it fills time, but that it actually meets and serves the need and the purpose for with which you are uh, using it. And so all of what we're going to do today, the backdrop comes from this book, How the Brain Learns. And you guys got chapter eight in your uh, pre-information. Okay, and then the next question that we're going to ask how can we use digital tools? Like right now we're using Zoom and how can we do this and enhance and motivate our communication online? And I don't have all the answers to all these, so I'm gonna help that we answer these together today, this morning. All right, y'all ready? All right, let's do it. Okay, so we've already done, this is our agenda. So I'm gonna, this is everything that's gonna happen today. So we know the questions that we're gonna settle in on. And these are, this is the way that we're gonna try to attack that. We've already done our welcoming ritual, which was everybody talking about where you are on a scale of one to five in your um, favorite quarantine snack. Y'all know what my love language is, it's food, because that's where I zeroed in. And then also uh, what language and levels you taught. So we've already done those two. We looked at the, our focus questions and now, uh, we're going to go over what's going to happen. So the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to talk about agreements, how we're going to function online this morning and this afternoon so that you have the optimal experience, so that you get everything out of this that you want to get out of it and uh, that we get from each other um, more than we bargained for, actually. We're going to go over proficiency-based activities, and we're going to get through as many as we possibly can, but I believe in um, quality, um, quantity, quality over quantity. So we'll stop wherever we stop. And if there are more that we don't necessarily get involved in, our hands in, you'll have the instructions for them and you are more than um, welcome to email me, call me, Zoom me, and I'll be happy to go over them with you if there are things on here that we don't get to that you're curious about. For each of the activities um, and strategies that we um, 
share today, we're going to have the exact same approach for all of them so that you can know what's going to come the whole way through. So the first, very first thing is I'm going to explain my rationale for this act for whatever activity it is. Then after that, I'm going to tell you how to do it. And then I'm going to push you out into a breakout room where you're going to actually do it. So you're going to be a student. You're going to be a learner. And I'm going to invite you not to skip that part of the learning. It'll be real tempting because you look at everything, um, I look at everything through a teacher's lens, um, to not allow yourself to do that right off the bat, but just to experience it as a student would experience it so that you know what it feels like to be a student and if it's something that you would want to do. So we're going to take 10 minutes for each activity to engage in it, immerse in it. 10 straight minutes and after 10 minutes of engaging then we'll talk about uh, the teacher lens of it and we'll stop and we'll put on our teacher lens and start talking about uh, what we liked what we didn't like what worked what we did what didn't work where we could use it a way to enhance it ideas and then we'll come back into the larger room and share so I'll the part the green part the experiential engaging and the black part the debrief sharing that's going to happen in the breakout room so I'm going to push out a little notes notice that says okay for the next you know three minutes you're going to debrief and share your thoughts about this strategy and that's where you're going to talk with your partner about what you thought about the strategy versus having immersed in it. Um, and then we'll come back in the greater room and um, share it in the chat. And then we'll infuse technology tools throughout. Um, and at the end, I have a couple of technology tools that we're definitely going to look at that I think are worth perusing. I know there's a gazillion tools out there. Um, and I, I just don't think that you should use all of them. You should pick the ones that work best for your students and then hang on to those. So if you already have technology tools that you love, don't feel obligated to take the ones that you see here. And then optimistic, optimistic closure. At the end, I'm going to ask you what, what strategy, what tool, what you gained from today that, um, that you'll take with you or that you valued. Um, and that's information for all of us, but it's definitely information for me because I'm still a learner myself and I wanna know what's working um, and what you thought about it. So that's our day today. That's what we're gonna do over and over. So these are the 18, um, 16, <laughs> 16 different um, things that um, I'm hoping that we get a chance to engage in today. The first 12 are activities. And the last four are tech tools. And we're going to go in this order. So you get a chance to experience all of these. And as language teachers, if you've been teaching for any amount of time, you've done some of these, several of these. And I'm hoping that we can get different twists on how to do them online. So I specifically chose strategies and activities that we could do virtually because I know that going into the fall, that's probably going to be where we land. So even though you've done these before, I want to invite you to practice doing them online so that you can um, give each other and me some more tips on how to make these even better than what we already know how to do. Okay, hopefully I haven't lost anybody so far. I want, it's weird. I, I'm, I'm used to seeing faces. It's weird not seeing your faces. Um, so here's what I need you to do. On your screen, if you hover over your name, and I don't know what y'all see, um, I do know that there's two ways that you can do this. You can either go to participants, and if you click on participants, you should be able to find your name. It should be at the top. And if you click on your own name, I want to say that it gives you the option, I'm sorry, not on your name, over where it says more. Um, and if you're having a hard time finding that, can y'all let us know in the chat box? But I want you to go to where it says rename and rename yourself. And the way you're going to rename yourself is you're going to call yourself your first name and then a dash and then what language you teach. So I'm going to be Nina-Spanish. Um, and whatever level. So if it's one, two, three, four, if you could put those behind that as well. So I'm going to put Spanish in parentheses because that's what I taught for over 20 years in Austin ISD, intentionally at the middle school level, um, because I wanted to work with the students who knew the least amount to try to get them hooked and excited about learning. Um, and then um, 
so for 21 years I taught, I should say that, I taught in Austin ISD. Um, I taught at two different schools for 12 years. I taught at a Title I, low SES, all the all this stuff and all the things school and worked with students there and they were phenomenal, awesome and wonderful and I learned a tremendous amount. And for the last nine years of teaching K-12, I taught at a school that was the polar opposite uh, with really high performers, uh, really high achievers, and got a chance to see the difference between the two populations. So I bring that experience to you. And I will say that the strategies that I'm using today, I use with both populations successfully. Um, I spent one year working in central office, working in professional learning before coming back to my alma mater to work with language teachers um, to hopefully go back and infiltrate language uh, classrooms with proficiency-based instruction. So that's my story. So I've renamed myself and hopefully you see on my screen now that I am Nina Dash Spanish. Um, and I put that in parentheses because I'm teaching, I'm not teaching the language right now. I'm teaching how to teach, which is a little different. All right, I can't, can y'all see if everybody's named? Let me look and see, oh, I can see it now. I clicked on it, thank you. Sweet. Armenian. Oh, that is really cool. There are some really cool languages out there. I love this. Japanese, German. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Spanish, French. Wonderful. Awesome. This is going to help us with our grouping because what we're going to do is get you started by connecting you with um, people who are teaching the same thing that you teach so that you can do this in your target language. Uh, wow, we have sign language. I love it. This is awesome. There's Chinese, German, Arabic. This is amazing. I love it, love it, love it. So there's still about two or three people. We need to make sure that everybody has um, your language. If you don't, we're going to end up having to put you all together and hope that you're in the same language. All right. All right. And if you're having a hard time figuring out how to do it, let us know so we can help you. Okay. So here are our ground rules. And you're listening to my voice for the longest amount of time that you're going to listen to it all day. Okay. After this, it's going to be mostly you um, talking to us. So what we're going to do is um, make sure that unless you are actively speaking, and I invite you to do that at any time, um, if you want to say something, you can unmute and talk. Um, and I will stop talking and listen and then we can all respond. Um, or you can just put in anything that you want to say in the chat. Um, if you want, if you like to share privately or uh, out loud with all of us. So otherwise you're going to remain on mute so that we don't interrupt each other when we're in the main room. But when you get into your breakout, when you're with your partner, if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera so that it's, um, if it's possible, if you won't lose connection, so that they can see your face and it's personal and they can see your mouth, um, because that's important when speaking. Um, and also unmute when you're in that room. The two that are in italics are there intentionally because this is what I use with students, not with adults, because I assume that adults are going to <laughs> post appropriate content. But I remind students that even though the chat, you're privately chatting with someone, um, that private chat comes out when I print it out. So private isn't so private um, always on Zoom. And then um, being respectful of other members, that's something that I would share with students. But again, adults, that's a part of what we do as teachers. In breakout rooms, please be sure that the conversations remain on topic. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world. We're adults and we have a lot of things going on in our own worlds. We're in our homes right now. I get it. I am in my house too. I've got to college now age kiddos who are doing stuff. My husband's at work and we got two dogs. So I get there's distractions, but if you would make sure that you are fully present in this time that we're together, um, that will help you to get what you need from this experience, as well as the person that you're going to be working with and the larger group of us. Um, we are going to take breaks every hour. We're going to get up and do something and move. We're not going to stay seated in front of the computer. Um, keenly aware of the time. Like I said, I taught middle school. So um, I want to stay true to making sure that we move. I encourage you, even at your, at your computer, to get up and stretch uh, every few moments, that every like 20 or 30 minutes, just to get your blood flowing. Now, I'm going to ask you to talk to me one more time in the chat. And this is, this is just going to be how it goes because we're 
we're virtual and there's 77 of us so we can't talk all together however i would like for you if you wouldn't mind if you would humor me the last one engage the way that you desire of your own students this is one of the ones um, that is specifically for adults and teachers uh, more than it is for the students and so in workshops um, I have to make myself remember to be the student that I want to teach, meaning I want to focus, I want to make sure that I'm practicing, I want to make sure that I'm there 100% of the time. Um, I want to know what are your norms, what are your agreements, what does that look like for you to engage the way you desire your students, what does that mean, can you unpack that in the chat, can you write what it is that you hope to do, plan to do, and hope that others will do as well. So if we could get a, a few responses in the chat of what that looks like. One device at a time, yes. I appreciate that. Respectful and on task and engaged. A good listener, yes. Yes, what you do, what you have to do, plan to do it and then do it, yes. Actively listen and participate, yes. Make a community, yes. Watch your airtime, yes. I love these. Focus engage participate i see engage a lot so that's definitely one that we know that that's something that we want to hold on to take notes yes focus only on one screen it's so easy to toggle please don't thank you yes stay driven yes make mistakes um i will model that quite often i'm sure <laughs> take risks and don't be afraid to be embarrassed yes all of that learn to enjoy listening to others yes Self-reflection, absolutely. We are all here to learn. There's not one of us that's perfect, not one. This is great. Participate, community building. I'm gonna say that you get, you get what you give, right? So if you want energy, you gotta give energy. If you want excitement, you gotta give it. If you want information, then be willing to give it too, which is why I'm here, because I want lots of information. <laughs> so I'm going to, um, as Carl reminded me earlier, share with y'all so that I can share with y'all have as well. Prepare for class by completing assigned readings. <laughs> uh -huh, that is funny because I'm wondering how many people read that uh, chapter eight. I'm not putting anybody on the spot. It's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Sweet. Raise. Let's see. Use your language. I got it. I love it. So when y'all go into those breakout rooms, again, I'm encouraging you. Use your target language. Use it, use it, use it, use it. All right. So I'm gonna talk away from the screen, but y'all keep it coming, okay? Um, but I'm gonna give you a, a place that we're going to um, capture our thoughts collectively outside of the chat room so that we can also have um, this information beyond today. Okay, so y'all saw the book, How the Brain Learns. Um, if you've not read this book, it is a must read. It's, I feel so strongly about this book. Um, I feel about as strongly about it as I do Harry Wong's First Days of School, and that's like one of the books that I've read like over 20 times, and I'm not exaggerating. I read it every single year, and I find new stuff out, and I, I remind myself of stuff, and it affirms things. How can we teach if we don't know about the brain and how it learns best? And so this book is teacher-friendly. Um, it does a phenomenal job of giving you just enough sciencey information that you understand what's what it is that you're doing but enough practical pedagogical strategies that you can actually apply what you're reading and then it gives you practitioners corner with strategies practic practical activities that you can try and use so i can't recommend this book enough it's the it's the one text that i require for my um pre-service teachers to read and it's the and it's the resource that they um tell me that they go back to they don't they don't sell this back they don't put it on a shelf it is actively used and there's so much good information from how to structure um 90 minute block schedule every other day courses to optimize it to you know peak times and off times and all the good stuff and some of the things i won't perfectly model and it's because i'm a work in progress but i keep going back to this book and failing forward so i invite you to do that as well and that's why we pulled out chapter eight it's just lesson planning y'all saw anyone who's uh, studied madeline hunter you recognize that right away but that's the structure that uh, we're going to work from so these are my i'm sharing this with you because i'm about to ask you to share with me 
the things that you can assume about me as a as a teacher um, this is my I'm gonna air quote philosophy I believe that what we know about the brain and from research it matters into how we plan and it should influence what we do in our classrooms so just because I've done a strategy a lot a lot doesn't mean that it's a good one I have to have a reason behind it and it has to mesh with what we know about how the brain learns which is what I just said just because I've done it before just because I've I was I learned it and this is how I was in class or in school doesn't mean it's a quality strategy um, and so I'm going to ask you to be real critical of the strategies that you're using I do that I'm doing that too um, so I'm saying this to you as I'm saying it to myself um, this is one of the ones that um, it's important to say out loud to my students and uh, make sure that they know why they want to be in my in, in the art class like students usually say that they want to be there because they want to speak well the only way to speak is to speak and so it doesn't matter how poorly how wonderfully how amazing um, is if they're going to speak they have to speak the more um, students are talking the better so right now Right now, um, I'm talking, so I'm getting the most out of this because you're listening and you're not going to remember most of what I'm saying, uh, which is why we have some stuff on the screen too so that you're able to see it. But they have to be engaged and they have to be the ones talking and they have to be the ones using the language in order for them to be able to utilize it and take it with them. Whoops, there we go. We all have a lot to continue learning and we're better in community than we are in isolation. So um, that's why you're here and that's why we're all here so that we learn together. And that's why I'm gonna push you out into breakout rooms and not just talk through these activities um, because we, we all continue learning when we do so in community. And students, y'all know this, they typically take our classes because they want to use the language. Um, typically, uh, outside of Latin, they they never, they almost never walk in and say, I want to be a proficient writer of whatever this language is, or I want to be a proficient uh, reader. They usually want to be a speaker and a listener. And so we have to honor that. I mean, obviously, we want them to read and write as well. But if we hook them with the speaking, then, um, then we can balance them out with the reading and the writing. This is a big part of teaching for me, and it's one of the things that How the Brain Learns helped me to realize is that who I am, me as a black woman teaching Spanish impacts how students learn my language and how they view and see me. Um, and if I know that, then I can use it to my benefit. And one of the things that I've used that, that knowing who I am in the space that I'm in is by saying, this isn't my first language. I had to learn this. And because I'm able to do it, I can tell you what the pitfalls are for a non-native speaker. And I'll be able to share with you how I was able to do it. And then you can share back with me and it makes it accessible to them. So knowing who I am helps me to impact my learners' outcomes. And then the other thing is that we are not isolated. Everything that we do is a part of the grander world. I hate using the phrase the real world because this is it. Like this isn't a fake one. Um, and so all the stuff and things that are happening in the world are relevant to our classrooms and should be a part of it because it impacts our kiddos. So equity doesn't just happen automatically. Teaching is so intentional. And so if I want my struggling learner to get stuff out of the lesson as much as my highest performer, it's not going to just automatically happen. I have to intentionally plan to make that happen. So these are things that you can assume about me as a practitioner. Um, and these are based out of what I've extracted, extrapolated from how the brain learns. So I'd like to know now why you're here and what your philosophy is. And so I am going to grab this link right here and I'm going to ask you to, where's my chat? There it is. I'm going to ask you to share by going into this Padlet. And there is the link. So if you will either split your screen or toggle over, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There you are. Now I see your faces. OK, this makes me happy. All right. If you will toggle over to the 
Padlet and start responding. The way you respond, if you are not familiar with Padlet, let me share the screen again so that I can um, model that. So this is what the Padlet looks like. I see you. All you do is you click on that plus button, you type in whatever you want to say, and I have it so that it is um, anonymous, and then you click away from it and it saves it. Okay, so you can start adding whatever it is that you want to add. I'm going to be quiet for the next four minutes. And in that time, you are going to share the answer to these three questions. 25 or less, what's your philosophy? Um, if you and your students, um, are y'all at 90%, which is what actual requires or suggests that we do as a recommendation for language? If you're not, what are the barriers? And then what specifically do you want to gain? What would you feel like today was worth your time if we accomplished it? If you could put that in this Padlet and you should be able to see it populating if, if you refresh yours. All right. And I am going to, okay, good. Good, good, good. So as y'all are doing that, I'm gonna stop sharing that, but you can still see it on your own screens so that I can see you. And, and just um, one, go for it. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I put this in the chat, but just a reminder for everyone that we're giving CPE credits out based on whether you introduce yourself in the chat at the beginning and then send a message at the end. So please, if you haven't, if you want CPE credits and you haven't done so already, introduce yourself in the chat. Thank you. All right. I still see people typing in there. Great. Great, great, great. And we are just, we are at 10 o'clock or as pretty close to 10, we're going to take a break because that'll be um, an hour in. And I want to make sure that I honor the fact that we are humans and need to stretch. All right, you should still be filling in and reading. Y'all, so another thing with the, um, I'm talking while y'all are writing, I apologize for doing that. Um, with the, Padlet that you're completing right now, when you see something that someone has said and it resonates with you, there's a little heart that you'll see um, at the bottom of their comment. Feel free to click it and that just shows them that you also agree with what they said or it resonates with you as well. Cool. Nice. I'm reading your comments. Go for it. I don't see the Padlet. Uh-oh. Do you have the uh, link? From, did you get the link out of the chat box? Do you see it? Yes. OK, perfect. Thanks for letting us know. All right, we'll take about one more minute, y'all. Would the people who've just joined recently please change your name to your first name and your language? Thank you. How, how do we read the Padlet so that we can see other people's comments? 
if you um, refresh the page, then you'll see the new ones pop up. And then if you'll hover over right below the title, so the very first uh, comment that's made, and then just toggle up, like scroll up. Tell me if that works for you. Not sure how to. Uh, I'll, you how, know, are, me, how, do you my, how do you refresh? I'm going to yeah. share my screen. Okay, got it. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see what I see. Right here. Can you see my um, my mouse? Mm -hmm. Okay. If I click that, that's refreshing my screen. And now as the comments come up, I can hover over it and just move up. There's a, are you able to do that? Can you see? Let me know if you're with me. Okay, I'm with you, but now I'm off of the screen. Sorry. <laughs> All good. Are we gonna have copies of the slides or? Notes? Yes. Yeah, I think you'll have access to all of this once it's over. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on the phone and I don't see the little plus sign to start adding the comments. So I, I am only allowed to, to write comments on other people. Ah, uh, gotcha. And I'm not, I'm not the expert on how to use it on, from a phone. So if anyone else knows how to do it from a phone, feel free to chime in. Sorry, can you repeat what was the problem with your phone? I am on my phone too. I couldn't co connect with Thank my you. computer. That it, um, that I see the padlet and I see everybody's comments below each of the three questions, but mm -hmm. it doesn't show me the sign plus that is showing on the desktop to start adding my own comments. I was only able to do on the first one when nobody wrote anything, but once everybody's comments were showing on, it disappeared. Oh, it's at the very bottom. So I wonder if you have to scroll to the very bottom to be able to I do did. That. You did and it's not Try, there. No. Try switching your orientation on the phone. That's what I had to do. Nice. Oh, let me see. Flip, flip, flip the orientation and then try to scroll up. Did that work? Checking. If that worked, thank you, Rona. I am writing that down. <laughs> my first tip of the day i appreciate it it, it actually got worse because now oh no in it there, didn't right work. no it got worse because now i barely see the comments hmm. mm. I'll, I'll eventually switch into my computer when i'm able to understood yeah so i don't know that's something that we'll have to explore. So that's good to know. Yeah, because I'm seeing that Padlet doesn't really have a mobile friendly website. Uh huh. So it's not something you want to use if your students are using uh, mobile devices. Mobile, that's good. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Are you right. using a, a browser or a, the app? She's using her, her phone. No, no, but is she using an app? There is an app for the Padlet. So maybe. Gotcha. Ah, uh, no, I don't have better. an app. Yeah. You're just straight in the, the website. Just straight in Chrome, yes. Gotcha. There, thank you for saying that, Natalie. There is a a Padlet app that you can use. All right, y'all, we are going to move. I'm going to use that information um, to help me. And I've already seen a lot of what I wanted to see. And it looks like in that, that uh, some of you guys are exactly where I was. It's, it's I saw some comments about um, level one and 90% being out of reach. And I'm going to tell you that I felt that way until I was able to do it. And, and, and it's doable. It is absolutely doable. And, and I can say so by experience. Um, so, and I want to share with you some strategies to hopefully some of these will be strategies that you can use to get to 90, even in level one. Um, and then I saw that the bulk of you want to leave with something new. Absolutely. So that's the goal too. And the only way that's gonna happen is if all of us are sharing um, and not just me, because I'm gonna share with you what I know, but I know there's a lot of other ideas in the, in the space and I'm gonna encourage us to put all of that um, together. So we've got, I'm aware of the time, we've got 20 minutes before our first break. So I wanna get us into our first activity before we move. And we have to have 10 minutes to talk about it and then five minutes to debrief it. So we may be a little bit after that. Okay, so we're starting with InfoGap. 
And so an info gap is, um, let me, actually, let me do this. Let me play the slide so that it makes it make sense. Um, so an info, info gap is when you have students working interdependently, meaning I can't do my work by myself. I absolutely have to have my partner. There's no, there's no wiggle room because you have my answers and you can't do your work without me because I have your answers. And so this is an example of an info gap. It can be used for grammatical structures. It can be used for repetitive um, information, but it can also be used for higher level speaking, which is what we're gonna do today. Everything that I'm giving you today is gonna be in English because that's the common language that we all have, but I want you to picture what it would look like when we get to the five minute debrief with your partner of what you would do in your target language at your level. So here, um, can you guys see my mouse? Yes, okay, beautiful. So here are the questions that you, the student, and in our case, we're gonna be the students right now, that the students have to answer and the responses are here. So my partner has to look at the pictures below to answer my questions. They will speak to me and then I will write what I hear them say. So this is a combo speaking, listening, reading, and writing activity. So I have pictures here, and these are based on what my students are asking. I mean, my partner is asking me. Um, with this activity, this is a real one that I use with students uh, from you teach. And so it'll say, what book is Professor Koike writing? And they'll have to look down here, and she's writing, um, I don't know what kind of book that was, but it, the, the requirements are that um, they have to, they have to speak in sentences, even though we know that we speak in fragments, but we know how to speak in sentences. So my requirement is always 100% of the time, you must speak in sentences, you must write in sentences, even though, um, like I said, we, um, we are able to have conversations in fragments. Um, no English is used when I'm doing this in my classroom because I want to have 100% target language. So that's why the pictures are there to represent whatever it is I want them to say. Um, it could be pieces of art, which is what we're going to use. So if I wanted to practice vocabulary, I would have the same structure over and over with different words, with different vocabulary down here. Like if uh, we were doing food, for example, I would have a bunch of different people in their favorite foods from a survey that I had done with them. So I'd have um, someone said peanut butter. So I would have your uh, piece of peanut butter up here and your name underneath it. I would have someone else, whatever they said they liked and their name underneath it. And the question over and over be, would be, what does uh, Michelle like to eat? What does Halinka like to eat? And so the vocabulary is what they would be working on, if that makes sense. All right, so you'll take turns asking these pre-populated questions. You're about to do this, so I need to make sure that you understand how to do it. You're gonna take turns asking questions. Your partner is gonna use their picture to answer your questions, and you're going to write what they tell you. Your partner is gonna ask you questions about your picture. You're going to tell them answers, and they're going to write what you say. Now this CUPS is what I use to support what the uh, language arts teachers were doing on my campus um, for sentences. They use CUPS, which stood for capitalization, utilization, punctuation, and spelling. And so that was my way of supporting, uh, like I said, the language arts teachers when I had students write in sentences, they had to go back and make sure that the first letter was capital, that the um, sentence made sense. Punctuation was on, on point, believe it or not, students wouldn't write, I know y'all believe this, they wouldn't put periods at the ends of their sentences or the inverted question marks or the accent marks. And if you're gonna be a writer, those things matter. Um, and then spelling. All right, so that's how you do it and why you do it. Those are the two structures that I said that I was gonna share with you guys. And then I'm gonna push you out in just a moment. You are going to be pushed out, but before you get pushed out into your group, um, you will need to either split your screen or, um, because you're gonna have to share. You're gonna have to share your screen because you're gonna need to uh, um, access that document. And you're gonna get the one that says info gap. And before you leave, we're gonna share our screen 
so that you can see it. And only look at yours. Do not look at your partners. I gave you both, but please don't look at your partners. Look at just the one that you have. And I'm trying to maneuver this so that I can see. Okay, perfect. All right. So this is, so one partner is going to be the panda and the other partner is going to be the detective. So let's work on the detective's um, point of view. Again, only look at yours, don't look at your partners to, to be true to the activity, okay? So if I were the detective and I need someone, I, I can only see Carl, Michelle, Beatrice, Halinka, and Maria. Can I get one of y'all to humor me and work with me on this one? I Thank will, you, Carl. I will, I will humor you. I appreciate it, Carl. All right, so I am working with Carl, and so this is my question, Carl. Who is this person? Carl is gonna look at the bottom of his and tell me who it is. Who is this? And there's no right answer, by the way. Right, um, this is a middle-aged woman of color. So on my line, I am going to write, this is a middle-aged woman of color. Mm -hmm. And then Carl is going to ask me his question. Okay. Hmm. Who should visit here? And I'm going to answer him by my picture. And I'm going to say, whoa, everybody should visit here. And so Carl is going to write that on his paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any questions about how this activity goes? Is there anyone who's had any issue accessing? Nina? Mm -hmm. Hi, I just had a quick question about uh, when you post these questions to your students, do you post them in the target language? Absolutely. Nothing okay. is in English. Okay, thank you. Yeah, nothing is in English. We're only using English today because it's our common language. Thank you for clarifying that, Blanca. And I have a question, too. Uh-huh. Um, how, how do you explain the activity? Do you model it first? Everything that I'm doing, what I, what I just did with you is exactly what I would do with right. students. No okay. different. Mm -hmm. All right, are y'all ready? If you have any issues when we push you out, because you're going to do this for maybe about, I think about five minutes to do the activity and then another three minutes to um, talk about what you like and don't like about it, how it will work and how it wouldn't work. Um, and then we'll come back as a big group and talk through it. Is that cool? All right. Um, if you get in your breakout room and you're having any issues at all, there's a help button. If you press that button, it alerts us. And so we can come in and help you. All right. Who said they have a question? Hi. Are we all going to be doing this in English? You're going to be connected with a person, hopefully, who is the same language as you. And so if you can do it in your target language, that would be better. Um, Hello, I have a, sorry, I have a quick question. So how do you ask your students to not to, uh, to, not to look at other people, the, the partners, handouts when oh i wouldn't give it to them they wouldn't have it i'm giving you everything because i want you to have access to all of it but they wouldn't have it right. a would have access to a and b would have access to b or I, yeah i understand the um in during a zoom class so you um pre-group the people and certain people will only have one part of the information Right. So you can, so if I were pushing this out to you in a classroom, I would have a folder designated just for my A's and you would only have stuff for A's. And then I would have a folder designated for my B's and you would only have access to my B's. I see. So during the Zoom class, when it's in the breakout room, you have to group them manually, not automatically, right? So make sure it's not A with A, A must be with B. Yes. Thank you very much. No problem. All right, um, Alex, I think we're ready. I'm sorry. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Go, 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 go. Yes, um, I'm only able to do the view on the Google Doc. I can't write on it. And I was just trying to figure out how to go and get the edit access. I don't know if anyone else is having that problem, but I can't type on it. You have to. I, I, 
I have problems too. I don't, I don't see the document. I have no access to any of what you're talking about. Uh -oh. Maybe because it's a shared document, we have to download it and then in your own computer, then you can edit it. Yeah, you can uh, download it. Okay. Make a copy. Let me see. If you give don't, me... Don't download, make a copy. Yeah, make a copy. I was going to say, I can go to... I, I, I downloaded it and I have it in my desktop. Sweet. If you and download it... In <laughs> where, where did you get it from? I don't see it. From a link from the chat. Yeah, in the chat. So if you, yeah, thank you for putting it in the chat. If you get it out of the chat, then you can force a copy. I should. Thank you. Yes, that works. Yeah, I didn't realize uh, that. Appreciate that. If people are having problems, can't they just write on a piece of paper? They can view it, but then write, <laughs> write your answers down. <laughs> We're all troubleshooting here. Absolutely, you can. Scenario, you don't have to type on the Google Doc. You can just go through and write it down on the piece of paper. And I'm going to hold on real quickly. Wait, uh, I don't know if it's gonna. Nina, I had a question. Uh huh. Um, so talking about, you know, you say you only give the A people A and the B people B, but when we're in an actual classroom again, you know, I've tried to do this, and they just look at each other's and copy. I'm gonna show you. I'll show you how to how to how to deal with that there's a there's a couple of things that i'm going to talk about with that and we'll talk about that when we get back to the when we get back i want you guys to go experience it talk it through with each other and then we're going to come back um and i promise you cheryl i want to get to that because that matters all right are y'all ready okay uh, how do we know who we are because again i go there you're going to decide when your partners when you get in your room good question you're going to decide who's the detective and who's the panda and then the detective okay. should only look at the detective's paper and panda only panda. So about five minutes to take questions, thoughts, um, variations, ideas, just unmute and um, put whatever you'd like to into the space um, and, or the chat. Somebody said same with Google Meets. Absolutely. Google Meets does this. WebEx does this. Big Blue Button does this. Um, same, same, same thing from all of them. I just want to say, can you hear me, Nina? Uh huh. Sure can, Lorraine. Um, I love, I've done things like this before, but I never thought to use with student information. I love that you gave the, their name and their favorite food or sport because it's so easy to use with the very beginners, which is who I teach middle school also. So great. They can practice their questions and their answers multiple times in the whole class grade. And it's really cool when you use students because they they start to learn about each other. But when they see their names pop up, their faces are priceless. It's awesome. They're like, I'm on here. And, you know, I, I will just warn you to keep a list of whose names you've used for what activities so that you rotate and use all of them. Because if you forget a kid, um, it can be equally damaging. Hey, Nina. Nina? Uh-huh. We talked uh, about the importance of certain location in our group. How oftentimes you give like an info gap activity to, to beginners and they get stuck on one word and they can't do anything else. And so maybe that it's important to kind of prep them uh, to think beyond or not to think too literally or get, get in the box. Yeah, and part of the reason why, um, I love that you brought that up, Carl, part of the reason why you'll see that I, I chose art for this one and questions that can't be answered, like what time is it? Who knows? Exactly. I mean, literally, I taught my, taught my students to lie. Lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the one time you get to do it free without any issue. Um, practice with saying what you can say and get good at it. Um, and we're going to do a lot of circumlocution activities and they all play into each other. They all play into each other. Yeah, I think it helps, helps them deal with ambiguity too. And there's a lot of ambiguity in language. So just go with it. Don't, don't expect there's a one right, right or good answer. Absolutely. Nina, a question. Um, yes. Doing this activity on Zoom, how, are you able as a facilitator to like jump into different groups? I was like, able to jump into different rooms. I popped in and scared a couple of people. Um, and in a classroom, it's smaller. But I'll tell you when I have done uh, activities where I want kids to practice and I want to know how they're doing, 
All I have to do is ask that once you get into a breakout room, you have the capability to record your screen. And so I ask the students, when they're in the breakout room, decide who's gonna be re the recorder. They have to record that screen and then send it to me. So I have evidence that they're actually doing what I've asked them to do in that breakout room. I wanted to just say, I like this because um, one of the challenges with Zoom, it's, it was easier with the kids that I had been teaching in person and then we switched to Zoom. But for new students, we, I started a new class where it was strictly online and I don't know those students. And it's a lot harder to kind of build the community because they don't know each other and they're not as comfortable with me or each other. So because this really makes you sort of, each person's gonna answer this a little bit differently based on who they are, it helps you know the person. Yes, and the absolutely. You're gonna see that all the stuff that we do, not all of it, but much of it is going to be about community building. And I don't care what level it is, level one all the way up, community building matters. It's, a, it's Maslow. It's, we've got to have our basic stuff met. We've got to feel safe. We've got to feel like people know us before we feel trusting enough to learn. And so a lot of this is going to be um, about community building. Nina? Uh-huh? Have you ever done this um, at an even simpler level where you give the students sentences to help begin their answers? Yeah, well, that's where if I were doing this with a very low level, right, um, I'll give you the first one that I do. Uh, the first one that I do is, is de donde es. I have a map and I have people's names on a map. So de donde es Jose, right? And then Jose is este uh, Puerto Rico. They just have to look on the map and see the information. So it's at that very basic level where everything is there. They just have to put it together. And so that's when I'm practicing structure. So yes, you can do it from the very basic level all the way up to uh, abstract. Sorry. This is Helinka. Um, I sometimes forget to tell my students that it's best if they can alternate. Like They have to alternate. Yeah, because sometimes you run out of time and then one of the partners doesn't get to do anything. But sometimes they forget it, and sometimes I just let them go on just to not break out totally the, the, the flow of activity. Yeah, it's always important to alternate, always, 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 always with uh, these kinds of things, because you need to practice the speaking as much as the listening. I, I will create, because I saw the need uh, during the activity to have maybe a bank of words and sentence stems uh, as a uh, support for the students because it was easy with my partner to get distracted and um, looking at the artwork and uh, we lost track if we were uh, responding in complete sentences or not we were so into the um, you know examining the artwork and trying to figure responses so uh, midway through we figured that out and and I think that uh, that piece of accountability of having that reminder of the stems and the work and will be a, a good help. Excellent, excellent. All right, now question. remember, yeah. I have a question. Can you explain to us how you are able to give different handouts to each student in the break room and make sure that the other one doesn't have access so that they can, they don't have each other um, answers? So, if I'm if so if 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 I were doing this true to form, I would have a link for person A and a link for person B, and I would tell you only click on your link. That's it. It's not, it's just not complicated. Try to keep it as simple as possible. So you have no way to know if they clicked on the other one too. No, I mean if they did, the yeah if they did then I mean they did. But I'm going to trust my students to do what I'm asking them to do. And if at, over time, you know your kids, pop into the room and see what they're doing. And they're recording their screens. <laughs> like there's a lot, there's a lot of accountability, but there's a lot of trust. And that trust goes always. Um, it's, I'm trusting them because, again, part of this is why are you doing this? Like what is the point of this? Like why were we doing this? What was the purpose of this activity? Could you do this by yourself? Absolutely. Do you need someone else? No. So why do we do it in community? And making them tell you why. And why are we only speaking the target language? 
Why are we doing that? Making them tell you the why gives them accountability to stick with it. I think the, the why gets lost uh, in the instructions sometimes. All right, y'all. It is 1014. Last, last question before we break. Can you know, I have a question for you. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, in terms of uh, level ones, um, they've never, de never done this info gap activity. Uh, you're trying to introduce this activity. Mm -hmm. You say you're always in target language. How do you explain this activity to complete novices in the target language so that they understand what they're supposed to do? Model, model, model to where so it's so. PPR. Yes. So that right. they totally, they can't miss the body language. And, and we, if you remember, even before we broke out, we did one together, right? And so each time I'm going to pick a different person to do the, uh, to model with me. You'll see, I'm going to show you a video clip in a second so that you can see what it looks like for real, for real, because it's, this is not an authentic environment. So you can see it. And I know what I'm going to show you is me in a classroom with students and I know we're online, but it's, a, it's the, the concept of how to be able to do this stuff in the target language. Yeah. Um, well, just um, before you showed us, you know, for many of us, this is the new authentic environment. We're not going is, back, especially college, we are not going back to teaching face-to-face. -face. So yeah. we really just have to start beginning to think that this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, me too. I'm living in that reality. And here's the, here's the truth. None of us has done this before. <laughs> so we're, that's why we're all here, because we're all going to be learning how to do this and how to do it well, um, because we want to do right by our students. And full disclosure, like I am out of the, well, I'm in the classroom, but out of the classroom. This coming fall, I'm borrowing a classroom. I'm going to be working with a peer so that I can experience this too, K-12. I need to know what it feels like. I need to know what my students are doing who are pre-service teachers. So I'm going to be, you know, doing, teaching both my pre-service teachers, but also teaching K-12 students so that I know what works and what doesn't better. So when we do this again next year, um, I'll have a whole different, set of things that worked and didn't work and like i said we're gonna fail forward yeah well i'm just concerned about the tpr you know the visual is such a such a big thing and having the props in the classroom and with the online learning that's kind of you know how do you, how, how do you prepare for that and how do you how do you convey that i appreciate that we're going to model a bunch of stuff and hopefully by the time it's all said and done um we'll all leave with some strategies that make that make that part a lot better Perfect. I appreciate that. And um, so y'all saw the cycle. That's what it's going to look like. What you like, what concerns you have, tech or no tech, and then ways to utilize it. So that was our first trial. And we did it with that activity because I've been using that one forever. Um, so I would like to share that um, our different ways to use speaking, proficiency, building tasks in class. And I'm not going to belabor going through this, but just to say that some things are contrived intentionally, and then some things are more authentic intentionally. And I think it takes a, a, a bit of both of them to be, become proficient speakers. So some things are gonna be guided practice, which is more teacher-ish. And then some things are gonna be communicative, which is more what you're going to experience in an authentic environment. And I think you need a, con a combination of both to become a proficient speaker. Um, all right, so let me move on. So I just want to put that out there. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is one of the ones where I'll show you what it looks like in practice. Everybody's done this before. Um, and online, it's going to look much like what we just did, except this time, you'll, you'll see that these, uh, these feel similar and they are, and the setup is similar. And it's weird that when you call something a different name, it feels different to students. Um, and I don't know why that is, but it is. So this one is called the picture's worth a thousand words, but you'll see the similarities. So this one is great for, uh, free speech and it's a great place to use authentic art, um, and things that are going on in their world. And so select two similar pieces of artwork or whatever it is that, that they are studying a topic. Typically, uh, we study topics. Um, I know that one of the, the things in, in the last text that I used had great, great art. And so I would take the art and I would get my colleagues art and I would um, use those and you'll see how I use them in a second. 
So display them outside of the classroom. This is if you're in person. So these instructions are for in person. Display them outside of the classroom on a wall. Students work in pairs. One goes and views it and comes back and describes it only using their target language and they cannot touch their partner's paper. Their partner has to ask them questions and they can go back as many times as they want and then their partner draws what they see. After time is up, you display it so they can see how well they did. Now online, it's the, it's the same as what we just did with um, uh, the info gap. It's the same thing, except this one is, there's no structure. So this is what you would build up to. This isn't something that you would do right out the gate. Um, so this is what it looks like in, re, in real time. And I think it starts about 12 seconds. And this one is, again, this is brick and mortar. So this isn't online, but, and this is where, let me pause recording I don't know if I can so that's what that looks like in a real setting in brick and mortar but for us it's going to look like it did just a few minutes ago we're going to push out to a room you're going to need the one that says a picture is worth a thousand words so you'll need that document and you'll notice that you have some help in the box to help you if you run out of things to ask um, but you should be asking things that you want to ask first to find out what you want to find out first. And then you're going to draw. Now, this time, when you're in your breakout room, I'll, I'll be quiet and give you guys a chance to locate a picture's worth a thousand words. Got it? Okay. Thank you, Margarita. I saw you give me the thumbs up. All right. I'm waiting to see if you guys got it. By the way, down at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a laptop, you see reactions, you can give a thumbs up to let me know if you got if you're if you're with me as well. Okay. So once you get to a picture's worth a thousand words, you and your partner are going to decide who's going to be which one and only look at yours. Can we give you the link? Whoever put the link in there, the first uh, for this other one, can you guys share that? Perfect. Sarah says it's right above. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so you're going to do this same thing. You're going to, one person's going to be one, one person's going to be the other, and you're going to describe it. Asking the questions that you want to ask. Don't feel like you're, you have to ask anything that's on that screen, on the page. Ask your questions. Draw, and then after about three minutes, you're going to switch. And then after that, you'll talk about what you get what your thoughts are. Cool? All right, you are going to be pushed. Oh, I'm sorry. If you wanna do this on the screen, you can. What you would do is, and this is only if you want to try it on the screen, you could share your screen and draw on the screen. And so if you shared your screen, um, you could use, I wanna say that you can let me see the same thing there's a there's a one that says there's a thing that says annotate if you click annotate it gives you a bunch of options to choose you can choose the one that says draw and you can draw directly on your screen so go to annotate and then draw um on your screen so I am going to ask that uh, you share. What were your thoughts, what's some concerns, tech, not to tech, ways to utilize this? Oh, so this is Tara. It was very fun to do. Um, I think <laughs> I drew second, so I think it was a little bit less pressure than the first, uh, to be the first person drawing. Um, but once you get over the fact that it's, not going to perhaps is not going to be Van Gogh quality. I think it was just really fun. <laughs> Rona, you were about to share. Yeah, I think this is such a great way to incorporate humor. It, it would probably be something I do in the beginning just to get everybody's attention and relax everybody that laughing, have them feel good, do some sort of, you know, uh, sort of disarm them in terms of like the tension. And um, yeah, and, and I never thought it before as, as like a warm up type thing. But for me, for my little ones, I think this would be a great warm up. Sweet, 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 sweet. That makes me excited to hear. Any new, any new ways that we can use this? 
Um, I often do that in class, and what's really fun is to compare then the pictures and then the original. I also use that for me as a diagnostic tool. What is it that they could not express? I can see that either by the drawing or going around listening. And I often ask the students afterwards, what word or words did you really feel you needed to know because you really could not figure out the circumlocution for that. Uh, but students really have fun when they do it. Um, and I, what I love is how the questions keep flowing because they really want to try to get more details. Um, so it's not just a description, it's also a good exercise to formulate questions. Nice. Um, did anyone else have a different way that you, oh, okay. Oh, sweet. Here, Nina. Someone, this is someone put, Sarah put in the chat. I was like, perfect. All right, so how to, so if you had any issues with how to draw on the screen, um, Sarah just dropped the link of how to do that in the chat. Amazing. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Nina, on our break, this is Sandy. On our breakout session, I was talking, um, I was saying that at least like for me, I am a terrible drawer and I would have done stickman. So I say, um, I would, would give the opportunity to take the students into their different learning styles. And uh -huh. for those who don't feel comfortable drawing, I could give them the option to write, make an, a chart, an outline or something so that not everybody feels left. Whoever doesn't like drawing doesn't feel left out. Sweet, I like it. I like it. I will share with you um, how I get my students to draw regardless of their ability because I suck at drawing. Just put that out there. I really do. Um, there are two types of art that remain in our mind. Really good art and really bad art. So either way, you're covered. You'll help the person remember because the purpose of the art, if we think about our why, is to help us to remember and think about what it is that we're saying and seeing if the person is able to get it. I love it. All right, are we ready to move? Oh, it was great. I, we see sorry. that you wanted, to, you wanted to, I saw your hand go up right when we were getting ready to move. Thank you, Nina. I was gonna say you can, for those of us that teach multiple levels, this is also something that I could have like my higher levels, like record themselves and then use that with the lower levels. And then it's like a dual whammy of like, you're getting your older kids or your higher, you know, along the spectrum students. And then, you know, it feels more authentic too. And it would be really neat to see them kind of have some kind of like competition or like, you know, friendly, like who can stump what class. Um, and I could just see at least my students really, you know, getting really excited and wanting to do that. I love what you said for multiple reasons, all the stuff you just said. And in addition to that, when we give kids an authentic audience who's going to look at their work and do something with it, their level of engagement increases. So if I say you're doing this, because some, a lower level student is, is gonna have to try to draw what they hear you say. They take a different um, approach to their engagement than if I just say, hey, you're turning this into me. So I love that for a lot of reasons. Um, I, can you hear me? I'm I sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, another idea would be to, within the same class, I love the comment before about adding humor to the whole uh, exercise, you could uh, actually pass on your drawings to the next group and they one person has to describe what they see from the drawing of the person before, which of course creates a totally new picture. So in the end, it's like a telephone game in drawing and writing. So the next group would have to write down what they think the picture is about and then the next group again would have to draw what has been written. Oh, it's I like pretty, that. Pretty, pretty fun game that you can do in language yeah. classes. Yeah, yes, of all that telephone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. That's awesome. Yes, 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 and yes. Thank you for sharing these ideas. This is exactly what we want. One more, one more. All right, Hi. Phoebe. Lydia. Hi, uh, I'm Lydia. I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, for, uh, you know, I totally agree with all the comments that people have, uh, have already shared with us. And the question I, I have for you is, will you be able to share this document for, with us, with the different activities that you are presenting to us um, now? I believe you guys are getting this whole PowerPoint at the end. Yes? yes and oh, great. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah, oh, great. Thanks. Okay. I really appreciate that. Oh, no problem. Okay. So we are going to move on. And I hope that when you're doing this, you're thinking of a bunch of ways that you can do this with your kiddos. Um, Cause that's, that's really the point. And then sharing stuff that um, 
like y'all are doing that I can also take and use with, with mine because um, the whole point of sharing is so that we give and get. All right, so next um, that we're going to do, oh yeah, we got, is Battleship. And I don't know how many of you guys are already familiar with Battleship. It's uh, one of the things that you can do online. We are going to use it. A lot of people use it, or the way I originally learned to use it was with um, verb constructions to help students with forming sentences using verb constructions. So on this side, there would be um, a list of pronouns or subjects, and then up here would be verbs or tenses. Um, depending on how you would do it, and then you would have the kids fill in their ships. If you are already familiar with how to play Battleship, it's the same. It's not different except you're using uh, whatever you're teaching from. If you aren't familiar with teaching Battleship, then I'm going to explain it, but then I'm going to ask for some help because this one is uh, one of those ones where I would like to see if what I said is what you heard. <laughs> so you're going to create ships, and I'm going to give myself uh annotation spotlight there we go so right whoops didn't want to do that yet so right here it tells you how many ships that we need so we're going to make four ships we're going to make four four spaces three of three spaces two of two spaces and then one the only rule for this ship for me is that they can't be diagonal or they can't crash so if i wanted to make um four spaces i'll pick any four spaces that go together so let's say i chose these four then i would draw my ship there so this is my four one two three four spaces one two three two and then one so i have my spaces right now if i were having my kids uh do sentence construction instead of just drawing boxes they would have words in here so if this were let's say yo which is a subject i in spanish and this was bailar then here they would write bailo because yo with bailar is bailo, so they would be forming a sentence. I could use this to grade to see if they understand how to make a sentence in Spanish. So you can do this multiple ways. It could be, like I said, it could be um, tenses as well, like um, present, past, whatever. So they form their ship. Their partner forms their ship. Now they need two because what they're going to do is alternate saying the coordinates where they think their partnership is. I make my students speak in sentences. So if I were getting them to practice verb constructions, then I would have them say, yo, bailo. They would have to say that. They could not say bailar because I want them to form sentences. And that would be their why at the beginning. We're practicing making sentences. Um, and their partner would either say that, and I would give them all of the um, words that they needed, like um, barco hundido, like you sunk my ship, or uh, you hit me or you missed me. I would give them those words that, so that on this handout so that they could stay in the target language while they're playing. So for us, we're going to practice, um, and you would mark. So let's say that I am playing with my partner. This is how I keep up with what I've said for my partner's board. I put marks in here as if I had already talked to my partner, and I said a red T-shirt, and my partner is like, ah, you hit me. I would put an X to let myself know I hit his ship. And then my partner went and I would tell them if they hit me or not. And I don't have to do anything more than, you know, mark if they hit me. And then um, I'd say to my partner, what about a blue tennis shoe? If my partner says, nope, then I put another mark, some symbol to let me know that I didn't hit anything. My goal is to sink all of my partner's ships before my partner sinks my ship. Okay. You can use the same things you can use your, I mean, you can, um, you don't want to have your screen to where your partner can see it because you don't want to see where they mark, their, where you've marked your ships, but you're going to have your split screen or however you've been able to manage with the first activity that we did. You're going to play this with your partner. You're going to draw a four, a three, a two, and a one, and then you're going to alternate with your partner trying to find their ships by saying the color and the item. Now, in Spanish, this matters because you don't just say a blue t-shirt. There's an order to it, and that's what I'm getting them to practice with this particular activity. So there's method behind the madness, and so we would model that. All right, I'm going to stop share. I've explained what to do. Are there questions about anything before you go back into your breakout rooms to practice it? 
None? Okay, if you have questions, ask me. We're going to take about six minutes to play, and then I'm going to, this time I promise, I didn't last time, but this time I promise I'm going to push out a, a warning to tell you, now start talking about how you would do this activity or if you like it and, and what you would use it for. All right, and we're going to our rooms. All right, it looks like everybody's back. All right, so here is our debrief. Y'all, uh, what were your thoughts? What could be better? If it's not something you want to use, cool. How lost? Carlos lost. <laughs> We, we ended, Jody and I ended up tied. So that was nice. nice. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the nicest things about this one is that um, it was definitely the easiest in terms of um, accessibility and speed at getting started um, because you could prepare your, your table in all sorts of different ways. As long as you know what you're doing and keep track of it, it works well. And then we um, said to each other, that we could also add some other elements. You discussed using it for verbs. We could even add in different verbs dealing with clothing um, along that, you know, along with it, and then have them conjugate verbs along with mentioning the colors if they're a little bit more advanced. So Ooh, I really, I, I really enjoyed it. Sweet, I like that. I'm taking that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this I like. Easy. I have used this a lot before in my face-to-face -face classes. And what I like about it is the versatility of being able to use it for basically every and any topic. And especially for, I was um, commenting in our inner group that it's good for repeating structures. And so many times students get used to talking um, for verb conjugations. They, they're used to talking a lot about um, first person singular. Mm -hmm. And this one, if you on the left, you put all of the verbs in infinitive and on the top, you put all of the different pronouns then they get to practice that control practice, but at the same time in a little bit of a fun way. Mm -hmm. I like the possibility that it offered for um, not just pair work, but I could see that you could do this in a small group as well. And so you can break out of the pairs and have larger groups and have the game kind mm -hmm. of move a little bit faster and be a little bit more dramatic. That would be fun. Oh my gosh, Michelle, I've been doing this game for all this time and I hadn't thought of that. Sort of like bingo almost, right? Yeah. And you Duh. Could, yeah. Thank you. I had, a, I had a question about what what you all are doing if students are shaky on their conjugation. Like, should you have a higher level student be the third person overseeing it? If since you can't necessarily get to all the kids to monitor? There are 70s, 80 experts here. So my voice is not the only one here who wants to respond to that. I can respond. This is Lorraine. I teach Spanish one and two at a middle school. I think this is definitely an activity that you would play to reinforce what you've already taught, first of all. And then I love the video of your classroom because there was text everywhere and I saw that you had the pronouns and the endings right there on the board. So I would definitely have something um, available to them to refer to, I wouldn't expect this to be like a test unless that was the purpose of the activity. Nice. Ditto what Lorraine said. Ditto and then also, um, I think it depends on your purpose. So you were saying earlier that your focus was really on the idea of adjectival agreement. And so, una falda azul, una blusa blanca. And so if your focus is really on the verbs, then I think I'd make sure to have a structure in place so that they could check their accuracy in some way with that as they're practicing. But if your focus isn't really on verbs, then maybe you don't really care um, what, they're, what kind of mistakes they're making with those verbs. I, um, this is Juliette for French, and I've used this a lot with the verbs as an end. And it's amazing how they know, they self-correct each other. This is something that they've already learned. And so I'm always impressed that one of them tells them, you know, they do in two. Sometimes I do two and two. So the more people you have, the more they're able to help each other. Uh, but they're their best teachers. This is something that they know. And it's really just a fun way to, uh, like an exit ticket, end of class. This is um, their self-correcting. Sweet. I've also done group, small groups, and one person's assigned to be the teacher. So they'll have their book or whatever access, accessible to the answers. And then they can switch, take turns being the teacher, and they like that. 
Stephen was asking if you could use real battleship games so they can be Ooh. hands on and then letters and numbers would correspond to numbers on the board. If you were, if you were, if the focus is practicing letters and numbers and absolutely, if you can use the authentic material itself, the that's better. Um, yes. So yes, absolutely. You can. All right. Have we exhausted this one? Are we ready to move or is there another comment before we it move? Like Tina had her hand raised. I'm not sure if she has a question. Okay, Tina, where's Tina? I didn't. I didn't really have a um, a question so much as just a um, a notice that, at least in my case, my, none of my students had printers, and so to to mark on something like this to actually build the battleships and remember where they are, they would have had to do that on an on a copy of this, and we already saw what a difficult what difficulty we had trying to make copies of things. So even before you get to the point where you can do this activity, students already need to be trained in how to access and then make personal copies of handouts. So that's always got to be built into the, at least when you're, when you are uh, beginning to use these sort of things, uh, obviously later on, you can just say make a copy for yourself and then they do. But I'm going to share with you, um, the, uh, other people probably want to chime in, but there are, yeah. there are tools that you can use to write straight on the document online. One that I know for certain that I've used and it's um, pretty user friendly is called Kami, K A M I. Um, it's like a, but it has like a 120 day free use and then you have to pay for it. But there's Envision, mm -hmm. I N V I S O N. These are all tools that you can pull up the document and write straight on the document where you don't have to have um, anything else. Now, if it's something where it's parrot practice, like what we're doing, they'll have to have some tools that they can write on it. But if it's not, then they can use the uh, white, the spot, the whiteboard. Also, if it, so I don't know it actually was just that the, the students need to, you got to invest the time in that. Yeah. Beginning. I mean, I teach 100% in the target language when I teach ESL. And I just always underestimate the amount of time and effort it's going to take yeah. to get them to that point. Yeah. I agree with that. Thank you, Tina, for putting that in the space. We definitely have to teach them some tools to be able to write directly on those on those documents. Yep. And there's a lot of people putting things in the chat. Um, Cami is yes, Emma. Cami is awesome, um, and and it's easy. It's so user friendly. So that's that's helpful. La playera. So aha. Uh uh. Oh yeah yeah yeah. You're, someone is commenting about if you were practicing letters versus la la playera azul. If you weren't using content if you were just using letters and numbers yes yep okay we are moving on so we've exhausted that one and you guys have thought of different ways i've gotten some ideas written down on my paper so thank you for sharing um let's see partner predictions this one is um probably one of the ones that um i like as far as team building is concerned um, you're going to think about your partner. I'm going to stop sharing because we don't need this for this one. That one is just there for a placeholder. So you're going to, you're going to need to access this document. And one of your, one of your partners is going to be the first one. And one is going to be the second one. I'm going to access my document so I can look at it while you all are looking at it. So it's called partner predictions. And this can be anything, any questions. So I want you to try, I think this is a word that, wait, I have it on my computer as a word document, but you guys have it in uh, Google, right? You can highlight directly on this one. So even though this one is um, somewhat speaking, it's mostly listening and uh, it, it focuses on the comprehension part. So you can ask any questions that you wanna ask. It's a would you rather, that's all it is. So you're going to predict right before you ask this question, you're going to predict which one your partner is going to say, and you're going to highlight it in one color. And then after your partner answers, if you get it right, you leave it. If you get it wrong, you're going to change the color. So by the end, you know if you've guessed your partner's responses, uh, how many you par uh, you've guessed right and how many wrong. So who has it pulled up already? Is there anybody who already has it pulled up? All right, Karen, would you mind being my partner? You have to unmute. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So Karen, you're gonna be the first document and I'm gonna be the second one. And I am looking at you, Karen. And because of 
who you are, I'm going to choose this one. Okay, so Karen, I'm going to, you want to go first or you want me to go first? You can go. Okay. Would you rather be able to talk with animals or speak all human languages? Speak all human languages. I know Karen well. I got that right. All right, your turn to ask me. You're number one. Um, okay, I'm picking. Okay. Um, what am I going to say? Okay, would you rather have a moderate detention or have a parent-teacher conference after school? I would always say parent-teacher conference. <laughs> detention sucks. <laughs> I was thinking of you as a student, and I thought you might prefer the moderate detention. <laughs> okay. I love it. And that's what you're going to do. You're just going to go back and forth and see how well you know your partner and who knows whom better. Okay. And then just keep track. That's it. You're, so you, you highlighted it one color, and so if you get it right, you leave it. If you get it wrong, you change that color. Okay. So is this in the target language? It would be, yes. And I would give them things that we're practicing. Like when we did foods, we did food. it was, are you more like a banana or um, a pickle? Are you more like a, a hamburger or a sandwich? It would be like that. And then they would choose. Or which do you like more? Like there's different, um, different ways that you could do it. All right. Are we, we getting settled with uh, making sure everybody has the activity before we move? All right, I see thumbs up. I'm about to send you in the breakout room. We'll take about three minutes on this one, four minutes at the max, and then we'll come back. Oh, I didn't have music I planned. I have a this question. Time. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if you're doing this in Zoom, I think that at, at school, I mean, definitely we have to trust our students, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that they're doing right. One idea that I love it is that they will record their, mm -hmm. their screen time to talk and then they will send that video to me. But um, if you have, um, will be easier that everyone will have like only one sheet and then you ask both the same questions or would you prefer to have like send in a group A and group B? Because I feel like, you know, that with the old printer and doing this and that they can just yeah and I, i'll give paper. you it depends on your purpose and there's not a right or wrong answer to that i'll tell you my reason the reason okay. i give you different questions is for comprehension i don't want you to know what question you're being asked because uh, in a conversation you're not going to have a pre-printed set of questions when a person is talking to you and i okay. want you to get used to having to listen for the response and to listen to what they're asking versus being able to read and comprehend because it's two different skills. Okay. So it just depends. If you're okay with it being more of a reading comprehension than a listening comprehension, that's fine. But know that that's what it is when you're doing it, right? So if I give it to you, I literally can use this activity as a reading comprehension. And that would be everybody gets the same questions. Mm -hmm. So then I'm just checking to see if you understood it. Perfect. What is the name of this activity? Uh, partner predictions. Partner predictions. Thank Lina, you. Lena, this is Sandy. I have a question. Have you used uh, this activity with beginners and what content would you have and how would you use it? So once again, so I taught levels one and two, the duration of my career. So everything I'm showing you was with beginners. So there isn't a thing that I'm showing you right now that I haven't done with the kiddos. This, that's what we, this is what we did. Now we built up to it and we used whatever we were studying at that time as our content. So again, my questions for them in Spanish would have been more relative to what we were learning at the time. Mm -hmm. So if I were teaching them colors, it would have been, are you blue or are you purple? Are you wearing green or are you wearing black? You know, it would have been questions that they could answer and understand and, um, along whatever topic we were covering. And it would have been something that I had gotten, uh, you know how you ask them questions at the beginning of the year about themselves? 
and you find out information about them, this is the kind of stuff I ask them. So I have some knowledge about who they are ahead of time. I don't know if that answered you, Cindy. No, I get it. It's it's not only the would you would you rather brother, but it's like anything. Anything. It's not just that structure of would you rather. I got absolutely it. I understand. Yeah, and actually, I would like to share a variation of this. It, it doesn't have. This is Blanca, by the way. This is not um, like. It's Blanca. It, there we it, go. It, oh, okay. So it, I got you. <laughs> so it takes the whole uh, idea of um, where the partner has to guess, but I think as an anticipatory said, it might be fun to do something like involve the whole class where I've done, would you rather, and you ask like really silly, funny questions, and then they move to one side of the room if they would rather do this, and then they move to the other. They seem to kind of enjoy that too. You can't do it too long because it can get a little wild. But <laughs> but I, it was fun trying this in class. Yep. Love it. Nina, I really like the activity. I think it's, I don't, I, all of these things, I'm like, why didn't I think of that? Um, and I really think that um, it's very simple, but I think you could use it at all levels. And it serves a dual purpose of having them speak the language and get to know each other better. And it would be really fun if you had some innovative pairing like something yes. I experimented with this this year was having my kids make a grid. They had to work with every single other person in the class and they couldn't work with someone again until they'd worked with everybody else. And it was good because that way they really got to know each other and you had classroom community. So by the time we had the shutdown, they knew each other pretty well. Now it might be a little harder to do that, but I think that these things are really going to help us. I love that. I love, we're kindred spirits, Kelly. When you said you have them work with everybody, that's, that, that's a no, like you, that's a, you have to do that. That's the only way to build community. I love that. And it could be any, like the sky is the limit. Your, our creativity is the limit. You can make this whatever you want it to be, whatever level you need it to be. Um, Stephanie? I have a, yeah, just a little on a, on a different level. We have lots of international students. So this exercise would also be fun about um, integrating cultural information. So you can ask things like, you know, do you in your country ride bikes more than cars or are there more cars than bikes or do people walk or, you know, to kind of integrate um, um, information on, on the country, on the spaces where they live, on the ways they do things and so forth. Oh my God, I love that. I love that. Or even from regional, you know, regional differences. I to get love to know that. Each, each other's living styles, houses, apartments transportation, schooling, anything. Sweet. Thank you. I'm taking all these ideas with me. <laughs> I hope you guys are snagging some as well. Um, okay. Students can ask the teacher questions. Ooh, I always work with my kids. Yes. And they love feeling like they can predict and know. And then here was a caveat that I would say, because you'd have the kid that says, well, what if they lie? Well, you should know them well enough to know if they're going to lie or not. That, that would be my, my go-to response. <laughs> and so then as you were saying earlier, Nina, in uh -huh. language, it doesn't matter if you lie or not because the whole point is using the target language and using the structure you want to use. So I keep on reminding my students, sometimes they ask me, am I, have to, am I supposed to talk about, it doesn't matter, just use the language. Especially when you ask them stuff like um, personal information. I'm like, I don't want your phone number. Like, I'm not calling you tonight. Just make up some stuff. <laughs> like, yeah, we just want to know that you can produce this information if you have to. So yeah. <laughs> I, I only I think want to contribute an idea. Um, this could be a good activity to bridge home and school now that they're everybody yes. is home. And maybe have the students create their own questions yes. and about their families or maybe interview their group in the family of everybody every member of the family and then come up with like the majority of my family what did they did they reply to each of them i love that i love that okay this is about to be good y'all wait till next year it's gonna be really good <laughs> i'm taking a lot of this with me okay did we all right so we got through partner predictions we are right on track to finish uh oh wait um, that's ahead of time. So we're going to do part of predictions and it's not, we're ahead of time. Okay. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to uh, prolong it. Where are we? Yeah. Okay. So for lunch, 
um, we're going to take an additional like 10 minutes for this. Um, you're you're going to need to write this. Oh, you know what? I need to put this in the, um, in the, in the, what do you call it? In the chat box. Why is it not letting me? There we go. Oh, what just happened? I stopped sharing my screen. No, I want to share the screen, but I want to drop the link in the chat box so that you guys can have that. So if you've never used Flipgrid, you are going to love this. It does require, so if you're not comfortable making um, an account, I totally understand that, but it does require that you make an account um, and you're going, it, it gives you the opportunity to leave a 90 second response. Okay. And as the teacher, Flipgrid is, um, I've never had to pay for it. And I think it's still free, but Flipgrid is just a video opportunity. When you go here, it'll prompt you to do all the stuff and all the things. In a moment, boy. Say it again. BB, were you talking to me? No, I, I have used it myself, but we do have to pay for it in the district. So the district pays for it and we are able to use it. Sweet. Okay. So um, I'm not sure how I, I'm not sure how I'm not paying for it, but I'm not paying for it. I didn't pay it. This is Maria, but uh, I don't recall that I pay at all. Yeah, I don't. Maybe it's because a lot of people went free over COVID. Well, uh, so it may be so that that's the case. Who was saying something? In Flipgrid for many years already, I think that maybe three or four years, mm -hmm. and I have never paid. What I have done is, <clears throat> when the year is over, sometimes I save a couple of videos, but otherwise I refresh. Just them. reuse it. Exactly, but I I never have paid. So well, if you if you if you've never used Flipgrid try it. I'm just going to encourage you to try it. And we'll look at this again at the end. So it's not something that we're going to do right right now as a thing. It's a lunch and learn. So you're going to record your video and then you'll you'll start to see kind of how it plays out. This is a thank you to the 70 folks who are here because um, we're in this together and we're making this happen together. Um, I appreciate the, the different strategies that we're using that you guys um, have chimed in and I had never thought to do um, I've already written down, and my, this is my, these are my notes, <laughs> and I've already written down several things that I'm going to modify myself, so thank you guys for sharing with me as well, and I want to pause and put that in the space on purpose, because I know how the brain learns, right, and so input, input, input without processing time, without thinking and reflecting on what you've done, and you'll forget it, um, even if you think it was really great and awesome and wonderful, uh, you'll forget what that information was. It's like me, I used to, um, I grew up going to church. My mom was a church musician and we'd be in church and the, and the message would go forth. And you'd be like, oh my God, that was so inspirational. And then you get home and, and someone would say, oh, well, what they talk about? And you're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember, but it was really good. It was really good. I do remember that. <laughs> and I don't want this to be like that. I want this to be something that you take with you and that you can apply to remembering a kid that you want to work with a specific type of student and an activity that you know was going to benefit that student that's what i want from this is that you will see you little human faces as you're doing these activities with us okay so we are going to uh move on and I'm going to share my screen again and this next one is very much like the first one the next two um that you guys do are going to be uh oh i can't screen share let me just try and try and change that okay thank you alex do you see me You, I can't see. How do I? How do I allow you to do that? When you go, I think you go to screen share right beside it, and I think when you click that, it gives you the ability to allow. Yeah, the green share screen. Try that. You see it? Is that working? Bingo! Awesome. Thank you. All right, so we are going to move to. 
right here. All right, so we've done info gap, um, and and like I said, I want to hear someone, anybody, if you can explain what you remember about info gap before we move, and then I'm going to ask someone else to explain a picture is wor worth a thousand words, someone else to explain battleship, and someone else to explain partner predictions. And you have one minute or less for your explanation. A different person for each one. Info gap. What is info gap? Uh... I love it. Who just did that was perfect. That's exactly why we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go. So info gap is where um, one set, one student has one set of information, another student has different information, and then they have to ask each other questions to get the other person's information. Sweet. A picture is worth a thousand words. And this one, you get a picture each and you had to ask different questions in order to draw that picture based on the answers that your partner gives you. Sweet. And then Battleship. Uh, I would do the Battleship is like a bingo game. So you guess and then like a chew at the in the and then do the um, battles with the, the another pair by making the mini grids, mini grids. And then uh, the reason I can say this is because I had a chance to explain to my pair. So if it, it works to explain to somebody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I've never heard anyone call it like a bingo game, but it certainly is. Like, wow, that's a good way to explain it. Okay. What about partner predictions? I can do that. Um, you, um, you uh, predict what your partner will say by asking questions. Um, thematically, they can mean anything from clothes to colors to grammatical structures, like um, anything, food. And uh, you ask a question, the other person has to, in their mind, think, think about the answer that the, the person will probably give, and then later double check whether that answer was the way that it was predicted or not. We, all right. So now we are ready for connecting the dots. Um, so connecting the dots um, is, I formally called it Foursquare, but it makes sense to call it connecting the dots because Foursquare uh, is a game that confused my kids because you play it with the ball outside. And anyway, so you're going to have a portion of a statement and um, there's going to be four people in each of the groups that we do now. And each person, the big thing you want to do is make sure that you're on the same number. That, that's important. Um, so everybody has to be on number one at the same time but you have your own paper and so you're going to say your portion you all say it aloud and a different person needs to help figure out what the full statement is at the end so the biggest thing that i want you to take away when you get ready to do this is to make sure that if you are a that you go first figuring out what the full statement is and with the help of your group and sharing it back with them then number two B should be the person to help try to figure out what the sentence is with the help of their group. And then B will be responsible for saying it back to the group. And then C will be responsible for number three. And then D will be responsible for number four. Even though you're all having your own papers, I want a different person responsible for each one as the lead for that one, figuring it out with the group. Now, I just took on a teacher hat and did the explanation exactly how I would with my students so you would know how I'm trying to distribute um, the, uh, the work, the workload. Because when I put you in a group, what I don't want is for my, my strongest student to do all the work. That's what I don't want. I want everybody equally participating. And so in this one, it's one of the ones where I would group this one uh, once I got to know my students better by ability because I want... I want strong students working with strong students so that they each have those, have those same personality types working together. And my struggling students, I want them working together because they'll be able to figure it out if they are able to, if they're given the chance and the time to do so. Um, so you will see this in a second. And I'm going to also say that before we start this one, there are so many different ways you can do this with so many different things. You can teach all kinds of stuff with it. Um, and as you start doing it, hopefully you, it'll make sense to you. So you're going to need to access your connecting the dots handout. I'll give you a chance to get that. 
Connecting the dots. Connecting the dots. Yeah. Once you find that, let me stop share. Stuff keeps moving on my screen. There we go. Okay. Once you access connect the dots, when you get in your group, the very first thing I want you to do is alphabetical by first name. That will determine who's A, B, C, and D. So alphabetical by first name. First person is A, second person is B, third person is uh, C, and the last person is D. The letter is at the bottom middle of your sheet. In connecting the dots, only look at your letter. Do not look at the other ones. Um, okay, thank you, Sarah. I think you just dropped the link in the chat box. So if you don't have that folder, you can grab it. Are there any questions before we, oh, you know what? No, we're not gonna push you out just yet. I'm gonna share the screen so that you can see it and we do one together before I release you to um, try it on your own. Let me see. All right, there we go. And there we go. Um, sorry, I'll have several screens open and I'm managing them. Um, I think that's it. Okay, so I need, can y'all see my screen? Mm -hmm. yes. And what do you, you see putting it all together? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so I need an A, B, a C, and a D volunteer to help me. That'll be B for BB. Okay, BB is B. Who's A? Joanna will be A. Who said A? Joanna. Joanna's A. Who's C? Kelly is C. Kelly, can you unmute for me? And then who's D? I'll be D. Never mind. I'm D. Okay. So A, yours says, the number one says? Each. B? Uh, B, 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 A, not. Number one. Oh, is. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, that's why we're modeling. That's good. Thank you. Number three. I mean, sorry. Uh, not number three. Letter C. Is the central? No. Number one, C? Oh, my bad. Each. Sorry, sorry. No. Your no. C. Oh, my bad. Okay, finally got it. <laughs> I can't read it because of the way it is in my Google Doc. It's Look at the screen. Brain. Brain, thank you. <laughs> and then I'm D, and so mine says unique. So letter A, help us figure out what this sentence is. Each brain is unique. Beautiful. Do we all agree? Yes. yes. Okay, so on our line, we are going to write each brain is unique. Mm. Got it. Cool. For number one. Good. For number one, and all of us are going to be on number one, and that's critical because if it's if you're not on the same one, it's not going to work. Mm. Cool. Yeah. All right, you are going to be in quads, and this one you have to do in English, otherwise I don't think it's going to make that much sense. Um, but you can figure, and so we'll take about five minutes of practice time, and then a chance for you guys to, after that five minutes do the activity for five minutes, and then after that five minutes, then we'll come back to. I'll send you a, a um, an alert that you need to start talking about. Um, how you use it and different things that you would do with it. And I'll give you more than a minute this time. We're gonna take eight full minutes. So I'm gonna take five minutes to just practice it and then three minutes to talk about it. We discovered that it's interesting that some things can be homophones and you cannot, you may not understand certain words if they are not grammatically explained. Maybe the students could give a shout out or something and would have to recognize those as for instance was the case in the brain's working memory. It was confusing because I was number D and I thought about brains in plural mm -hmm. rather than um, brain with an apostrophe. Yeah, apostrophes. So that was an interesting observation. That's good though, right? Because then, well, for English, it, it, it forces you to understand that punctuation matters. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, when I'm using this particular activity, I'm looking at structure. And I'm putting things that are common mistakes with structure together so that I can help them practice it in a way that they figure out how it's supposed to go. So like describing in Spanish, right? So if I'm saying something as simple as the blue cat is running, they have to know how to structurally format that in a way that it makes sense in Spanish. So I would do that also with negation. You got to know where words go and I would intentionally isolate those so that they can process that as a group and talk about it together so that it makes sense to them. So that's how I've used it. And I don't know how other people have processed this activity. Now that y'all have all done it, we've got 75 experts. What are y'all's thoughts about it? My, 
my first thought was um, that I'm very visual. And even though English is my first language, just hearing the words it didn't work for me. I found myself scrolling through multiple times because I needed to see it. And so we talked about maybe having the words written on note cards and each person you know, has their note cards still. So when I say it, you could go around just saying it first, but then if you're stuck, then y'all could lay the note cards down and work on arranging it into the correct order. Give me more. I, uh, I... I, I am a Spanish teacher in a dual language program. So for us, um, uh, one of the uh, activities or, or one of the, the teachings that we have to do is the contrastive analysis of the language. And so I see this activity and uh, um, I think it was oh, in, the, in the activity with the battleship being great resources to uh, compare and contrast the uh, parts of languages of the, of the English and the Spanish that are similar or different. Any other thoughts? I'm not, so these, y'all know with language, uh, we're not originators of almost anything. We just take it and make it and tweak it until it fits what we need. So you're not hurting my feelings if this is something that it doesn't fit or doesn't make sense to you because I didn't make it. Like it's not my original. I think it would be fun in German because students uh, uh, hate the idea that in German the verb is always last, no matter how long the sentence. So you could Ooh. make it actually humorous, you know, you, you know, with humor somehow, and have the one that kind of ends up with the verb shout out, you know, particularly loud or something, so that you can hear how you I have to it. listen to a lot of things before the <laughs> verb shows up. So you could uh, make it also fun. That's awesome. We could use. Um, proverbs or popular sayings, refranes, whatever yes. would you do, or you could even use a song lyric if yep. you wanted to, you know, use the chorus of a song or something that could lead up to something, another something bigger. I would say that this is a great pre-reading activity. It's really, really good as a pre-reading. And further, we were in the same group that um, we had trouble, or not trouble, but we, this kind of goes to, so in Russian, you can do things in different order. And so there isn't a definite order, like you can, mm -hmm. so a student may not learn a, a, a beginning to the end. And we did that with number five, where we were confused by the apostrophe S, maybe mm -hmm. I was, and we did, instead of the brain's working memory has a limited capacity, we did the brain has a limited capacity for working memory. If it works, it, does, did you use all the words? We added yeah. Some. You added some. Really? <laughs> Did we cheat? We cheated. <laughs> we oh, oops. Attention. <laughs> I'll just add you. We just made it our own activity. <laughs> yeah. Eager beavers. I love it. But no, the same is true in Spanish and, and in English too. Like you can say the same phrase multiple ways. And it begs that too. Like that needs to be something that people know. There's not one way, right way to say something. That's important to know. Like... Language isn't going to be this, you know, structured, perfect little thing. It, it gets mushed around and, and it has the same meaning different ways. And that's, that's a part of it, too. I teach uh, pronunciation to high-level English speakers. And I do something similar, but it'd be really great. You can populate it with ED endings, different sounds that they have trouble with. And just, just remembering the words in the order, even if it's the same order with different endings, they, it's very challenging, even for advanced learners. I have two questions. Okay, so when we compare a sentences, of course, we have a bit of an advantage, but I mean, learners, language learners will not all have the same sentence sometimes. So how do you want the discussion to go? I mean, do they try to send a target language? Because they have to explain to each other what they think this is better than the other version. Right, right. So there's 90, there's 90, 10, and 10 can be in English, right? And so the work that they're producing, this is, this is their thinking and their writing. So I'm not, this isn't a target language 100% uh, thing that they would do. Um, oh. Okay. Definitely not at the lower level because they are expressing their thoughts and thinking about their thoughts, but they're producing the structure that I want them to produce in the target language. Um, gosh, there was something else I was going to say about that and it just slipped me. Okay. Tell me your question again. Okay. Um, I was asking when the students are finished putting their sentences together, 
be discrepancies. Yes, yes. Have to trust with each other. Okay, so that's the other part. They can agree to disagree. You have your own paper. You write what you think. You write what you think is right. I write what I think is right. No love lost, and we've had a discussion. That's why four pieces of paper instead of one. Right, great. And my other question was when I looked at the slide at the very end, it says once you've completed the task together, determine what these statements are and where they come from. What do you mean by where they come from? Who knows where these statements came from? Okay, like they have to imagine. Nope, these statements came from somewhere. From our homework. Came from our reading. Uh, pre work reading. Oh, all right, so yeah, okay. Yeah. So, what if it is something totally new? I mean, they know all the words, but they've never seen those statements. Then I wouldn't put those. I mean, you, you adjust it to whatever you need it to, to say or be. Like, I gave you something so that when you finished it, you still had something else to do. Sure, Sandra. It was challenging because I'm more visual, and, but I can do it if I do it uh, some of the or two times. But how can I explain this activity to Spanish one students? Because that's my um, challenge in the classroom to try to explain mm -hmm. in Spanish. Because a lot of times I have to do it at the end in English because they don't get it. And so, so I'm gonna, and again, there's experts all over this room. So you guys make sure you chime in too, okay? Um, Online, I can't answer that because I, I, it's, it's going to be new for me too. I'm going to try it and see what happens. But in person, I am physically acting things out and then we model the very first one together. And then I do thumbs up, thumbs to the side, thumbs down. Where are you? I get a kid to explain it back using the target language the best they can. Then I do another check to see where they are and I check on my thumbs to the side and my thumbs down then I will get them started and then I'll go and check in with my kiddos who were thumbs uh, to the side of thumbs down. Um, but if I, here's what I know about me as an English, uh, as, an, as a non-native uh, Spanish speaker. If you give me the opportunity to hear it in English and I know it's coming, I'm not listening to your Spanish. I'm being honest with you. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the English. And if you tell me there's an out, I'm gonna take it every time. And I'm going to push back and push back because learning a language is uncomfortable. It's mm -hmm. challenging. Um, I, you won't always understand every single word and they need to know that that's a part of it. That's what it feels like and that's normal. It's totally okay. Do you get the gist in the big picture? Can you watch other people? Because that's a part of language learning too. Can you figure out what you're supposed to do by looking at what somebody else is doing? Yeah. That's culture. Those are all teachable moments that are a part of the instruction as to why it should be in the target language, because they have to pick that stuff up. And my goal is that I could drop my kids off in a Latin American country, in a Spanish speaking place, um, and walk away from them and they won't die. That's mm -hmm. my goal. Correct. Um, and so as long as they can communicate and say what I need them to say, even if it's not perfect, I'm good with that. But I gotta give them practice being uncomfortable. They have to learn what that feels like. And I will, I will stop in class and say, okay, y'all, how many of you that was extremely uncomfortable and, and difficult, raise your hand. And they'll do this and I'll say, look around the room, you're not alone. This is how it's supposed to feel. It's hard. And then we move on. So, yeah. Okay, yes, is it? Okay, I got it. Yeah, and, and, and uh, as far as like the not breaking your target language, um, it's critical, y'all. Uh, that, that when you read How the Brain Learns, you'll, you'll understand how important it is that your brain stays in that mode. Because when you start thinking in Spanish, you start thinking in Spanish, and that's what we want them to do. We don't want them to think in Spanish and then translate to the other, uh, well, in whatever the target language is, and then translate to um, something else and then translate back. We want to eliminate that by giving them target language, target language, because there's some things I don't even know in English because it wasn't presented to me that way. And I love it that way. Um, but if there are things that I don't, that I can't get to in Spanish until I go through English because I learned it that way. And I'll give you the example of the alphabet, right? So if I give you, if I just picked I'm not my own kids, what comes first? Um, let's see, M or K, right? And you have to sit there and go through the alphabet song before you can figure out which one comes first, right? 
And it's because that's the pattern that you learned and you got to figure it out. But if I ask you what comes first, six or nine, well, you know the values of those and they're just, they're just a part of you and you know nine is higher. Just, I just know. And it's because you're not necessarily stuck to that pattern. Anyway, that's my explanation. That's how I make it make sense in my brain. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Sandra was like, I'm not gonna ask any more questions. That three minute explanation was way too long. I apologize for that long explanation. <laughs> I promise I won't talk that much. Any other thoughts before we move to the next activity? Thank you for bringing that into our space, Sandra. I feel that this is not an activity that you will try with your Spanish one, not in the first trimester perhaps. It's something that builds up. So you will do uh, more simple activities, but still using the target language. I will certainly say that this is a second semester activity in my head for Spanish one, because they have to have some understanding of the language as well as not Spanish, but you're understanding how the language is put together <laughs> in English alone. So I feel that this is an activity you could use for more advanced level Spanish two, perhaps three. And the Spanish ones, we're just going to keep it simple. You could, definitely. I used it with one, um, like I said, to teach when I was trying to teach structures. But also, if I'm teaching them how to write and I need them to do specific things, this will be one of the t activities that I would follow up a real active, we went crazy in the classroom and we needed something kind of calming, but still interactive, like um, forming sentences and forming questions and making sure that they knew where punctuation went, that kind of thing. That's something that they could use this for too. But um, I have a question, Nina. Sure. Uh, saying, um, adding a little bit of what Bibi just said, I agree. and. I, I, hard and disagree at the same time because I teach Spanish one and I have done activities similar to this one mm -hmm. um, but what I have done is I have a group only with three kids um, I uh, always like to uh, work with a group of three no more than mm -hmm. that but um, and then I just give them words simple words and simple sentences yes so say the house is big so yes they can put it together where's the noun or yes. the blue house yes. is big right so they have to know, i mean but yeah the, uh, the, the beauty for this activity is that we can modify it yep. to all the different levels you can go to ap to i mean from spanish one to ap um and that's a beauty i think Right. And it could be used for different things, right? Like I could have asked you guys to now that you have these sentences, do something with it, like use this to tell a story, put it in an order. I could ask you to draw a picture based on what you now have. Like there's so many uses once you have the information that you can have them springboard from. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Dulce? Yeah. Hi. Yes. I wanted to say um, about that. I've actually used on on scrambling in a sentence. I've actually used it on Kahoot before, mm -hmm. like a couple of years ago. You actually can, you don't necessarily have to do it this way. I've used it on Kahoot where I would um, get my students to work in partners, either of two or three, just one, one computer and you give like an A, B and C choice and you, you put them together. I don't know if it's called Kahoot Jumble or Kahoot Puzzle, but they have something like that where you can do it on the screen together and you have to be able to to move like where the noun goes the adjective like if i say the sun is yellow the sun would be like letter a is is b and yellow is letter c but they're all mixed up and you get to make the sentence you don't necessarily have to put a capital like letter for the for the sun okay. right the sun but I, I've used it that way before. Oh, I didn't know Kahoot had that, that yeah. feature. I'll be playing with it right after this. Thank you. You, you can do that on Quizlet as well. Yeah, I, yeah, Quizlet, yes. But you Kahoot can do that on Quizlet as well. Sweet. And that's what I was saying for those of who, those who were in my group. I told them I have an ABC block, and this is what I was talking about, where she just said that I have a lot of sense that I've broken up into A, Bs, and Cs, and they do those all the time. But Love I'm, that. Quizlet. So you use Quizlet. So Quizlet has that feature. Which which version of what? If you how do you Quizlet Live? Yeah. And if you like, you can. I start with A and B, and once they have put those two together, then you can add the C. Then we'll put the, the parts that they put together with A and B. Then we'll add C, and then we eventually will add the D. You have to break it up. You can't do it all at one time. You can't do A. And oh. B. 
Okay. <laughs> Which Got is it. One level but one level one level is doable at one time. But that's what I'm saying. Right. Like, it does give you the pieces like that, sort of how she's saying. It breaks the sentence, and you're the one who creates it. So for one option, I would put the sun. So they wouldn't be like, like at least for level one, for the higher right. level, yes. I would oh, so they're only, okay. The, so it's still the normal functions. Okay, I thought that you were able to. Oh, got it. No, I understand you, now. No, you can't. You can. It's like a puzzle. It's that's why I don't remember if it's called Kahoot Jumbo or Kahoot. It's a Kahoot Pro Kahoot Jumbo. Okay. Yeah, it's I got yeah it. so you can. I did it with uh, ordinal numbers. So I had like grouping um, the numbers to teach time. So through 12. So I would have a certain number and they had to put them in order. And you can, so you can do that on Kahoot. You can designate which ones come first, second, third, fourth. So a grouping. Okay. It's that just one of the sense. options. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to be okay, playing with that. I That's good to know. Um, Jam boards, anybody? Who said three dollars a month? Oh, never mind. Okay. Is a Kahoot Jumbo? Is it under the Kahoot Pro? So you can do, you can play the game, but you have to pay three dollars a month. It's not free. Okay. okay. There's yeah, that's what I was saying. I think it's a paid feature to do the jumbo. Got it. Okay, <laughs> that's why I don't know about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also right. jam, jam boards. Anybody use that? Jam boards, you can post uh, sticky notes and write whatever you want. I did words with definitions, and everybody can get on and manipulate them and put them in order, whatever. It's really fun. Sweet. Word, word associations, but you could do the sentences easy enough. What's that called again? That. I, I have Can you write that in the chat? Discussion. Yeah, I did. Yes. Jam boards. It's on Thank Google. Thank you, Karen. It's part yes. of the Google Suite. I it's have used it for Google. discussion. Yeah, it's a part of the Google Suite, but I can. I have also used it for live discussions with the kids that I post a question and they will have to use their sticky notes to respond and then to group them to come up with a theme and things like that. And this is why you get 70 educators together it's right here. very accessible. My students just clicked on it and they were in it, just like the one you initially gave us. Sweet. It's yeah, it's one, of the, it's one of the few things that I used online that the students didn't have any problems with. This yeah, the jam they don't have to sign in. And, yeah. Okay, all yeah. right. Jamboard it is. If it's a part of Google, then it should be free, right? Yeah. It, it is free. I mean, they also sell a multi-thousand dollar piece of hardware that you can use with it, but that's not necessary to own, so. Wow, okay. All right, thank you for those tools and tips. I grabbed some more there. I'll be using Jamboards, and I'm gonna look into, I'm, I'm still curious about this Kahoot. Um, you guys got me curious. I wanna look at it, see what it does. I'm sure they have a free off, a free trial that I can try out. Okay, and so now we're moving, where are we, um, into, where were we? We just did four clues. Oh, no, we did, we did connect the, the dots. We haven't done four clues. Okay, so four clues. You'll access this in just a moment, too. Same thing. This, these are four, um, these are quad activities. So with four clues, you'll, um, you will have one of four clues. And so for this one, um, I really, really liked this because it taught something that would help my students become better writers later. And it was setting them up for Spanish 3, Spanish 4, and level 1. And that is with the syllables because in Spanish, you have um, diphthongs and they have to know which vowels do that and produce one syllable versus two. And this is one way to naturally have that happen without a big old long, huge grammar lesson. And they become really good at it. But when they are learning, like for example, rules to when and when not to use an accent mark, they already know how to count syllables. And it's just, it's another thing to make life easier for them. So um, a colleague of mine shared this with me years ago and I, have used it since to introduce vocabulary. So whenever I've introduced something that we're going to be learning, they would get um, a list of just what we're going to learn, those, uh, those, the list of words that we're going to use, and then this is how they would figure out what those words are. Um, 
with pictures. So they'd have the word in like a picture. And then this tells them more information so that they could figure out what the word actually is. And they would tell me what they think the English is because I want to make sure that they get the right, the right stuff to begin with, to work from. So syllables is the first section. Let's see if that goes away. Yeah. So there's going to be two syllables. One of the things that I learned real early on is never to start with the real letter of the actual word because then they wouldn't do any of the other work. They would just go down the list and see what starts with X, what starts with B, what starts with whatever, and they would fill it in and not have, have had to th uh, think through. So I started doing begins with using um, the um, definite or indefinite articles. So the chair or a whatever or whatever the they have to go together. So you'll have a bunch of the same letters at the beginning here. Um, and then whatever it ends with, and then you have a clue. Now, the thing about this is no one person has all four of these. All four of you have one of these, and they're randomly scattered throughout everybody's paper. The only thing that uh, the students are required to write is what they think the word is in English, and then what the word is in the target language. Um, and they already have the target language there. So right now, I'm just seeing if they understand. This is comprehension. Do you understand? So if I tell you it's two syllables, it begins with the letter F and it ends with the letter C. In this activity, we are about to engage in together right now. What is it? It's the activity we're about to engage in right now. Four two syllables. Two. Four, four clues. clues. So the answer would be four clues. Right? And so you write it there. Does that make sense? Yes? No? except that you wouldn't have all of this. I'm looking at faces, but I'm only looking at like four faces. So y'all four, y'all don't know who you are. So everybody, thank you, Karen. Have to let me know if that makes sense to you. All right, so that- ends with C. Oh, did I say it ends with C? My yeah. bad, I lied, it ends with S. I got that wrong. Okay. <laughs> so I need, that's why y'all were looking like that. Oh, uh, so I made a mistake. So that's one of my- I was also, I was also stuck on the, you said it's a word. But, but so would it actually be a word rather than something like two separate words, like four clues? Oh, it's going to always be more than one word because it's going to have the um, definite or indefinite article before it. Oh, sorry. I missed that part. Okay. Sorry about that. No, 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 no. That's a good question. Yeah. So when you, when you that just means that, I didn't explain, explain it well. Okay. Who had a question? I heard someone say Nina. Uh -huh, I'm going to... Uh-huh. Go for it. Uh, you said that they already know the target language word like they already have it so yeah I've, I've i've given them a list of this is what we're going to learn with pictures beside it do they have a list of the words and the picture that matches the word that matches the four clues that they're going to be given they have the, the list of the words in spanish and the the pictures and there those two are already matched up yes okay thank you that's their vocabulary list now i'm going back and making sure they understand what they are Okay, thank you. And um, so I'm doing it this way on purpose because I'm going to ask them to do lots and lots of circumlocution. Um, and I'm showing them an initial way to circumlocute each of these words by how I'm writing it, like how I'm explaining it, if that makes sense. Um, let me see. I pulled up, there it is, what you guys see because you're going to use your reading. So hopefully you have that. Am I pulling up the right thing? I think it's, yeah. Okay, yes. So y'all, this is what you guys received in the um, reading for the homework. It was in the, the planning guide that you received with, it told you like the order of events for the day and all that stuff. And it gave you a link to this. We're gonna, all the things that you are going to use from your four clues is going to come from here. So those of you who um, finished all of the four square, all the, I'm not, the connecting the dots, it came from here. Those statements came from here. So for clues, what we're doing right now, it's gonna be one of these things is what I'm describing from daily lesson design. Let me make sure. I think it's daily lesson design or else it's the um, parts of a uh, lesson cycle, it's one through part nine. Parts it's parts of the lesson cycle. Okay, so then it's the parts of the lesson cycle. All right, so you'll wanna look at this page 
and they're not numbered. So, well, yes, they are. It told me page six and seven. So if you have access to that, it'll make it a lot easier. But you, you know these things already from lesson design, um, you know, independent practice, check for understanding, modeling input, purpose. It's all the stuff that we use to um, lesson plan with. Okay. So that is what we're going to practice when you go into your room. And if you have any questions before we go to the room. Thank you. They just dropped it in the chat box. So you have six and seven there. Uh, Sarah, you're awesome. And you are going to give each other the part of the clue that you have. And just like four square and four square, just like connecting the dots, you have A, B, C, and D. So when you get in there the same way, whoever is A is A, B, C, and D, you share just your parts. And the only thing that you're responsible for is figuring out what it's describing. Okay, it looks like we're back. It took time to figure that one out. Yeah, that one, that one takes time to figure out. It does. Um, okay, thoughts about it, how it could be used, not used, structured. What are your thoughts about um, that one? I think for me, the syllables portion really throw it because I was thinking of one word versus, <laughs> so maybe we wrote in there a uh, number of words, yeah. then that might be more helpful. And so I think we were trying to figure out that portion. Um, the syllables? The, the mm -hmm. syllables. That was more like, to me, that was kind of what confused me. Once we got beyond that and understood that it wasn't referring to syllables per se, but like the amount of words that we were going to see. Um, for me, essentially, the clue really helped me um, knowing Ooh. what was that referring to. So while that we were is... doing, uh, we were also doing a reading comprehension because we were supposed to look at the reading. And yeah. I, I think we both were, uh, all, uh, all the members of our, our, of our team were thinking about how would I apply this in class? Uh, would I work with a short reading mm -hmm. uh, about a short story or, or an information on a newspaper? news report or a grammar explanation how to use it in class so we were thinking in both channels as a student as a teacher nina you know uh -huh. what i would you consider in doing in spanish creating a column that says articles articulos articulos and then just and that way you can say that the word uh, sapo has two syllables so you're look you're now honed in on the the vocabulary word and you're still acknowledging that there, there's an article that goes with it. I mean, you cannot not have an article in Spanish. Would that work? Um, you can try it and see, like literally try it and see. I'm doing these things with you guys that I've already used with my kiddos. So they've gotten used to the structure and they have rolled with it. And they, you're seeing this with brand new eyes if you haven't done it before. Right. So you'll wanna do something that makes sense if you're gonna use it to you. I would say play with stuff, play with all this stuff. Like I, I'm not using it exactly the way that it was shown to me either. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? So Liz, I was gonna mention that, um, again, this always brings to mind how much longer something takes the first time you do it. Uh, yep. And I never ever build in enough time, um, as you were mentioning, giving us enough time. It would have been enough time if we had done it before and we knew we could dive into it. But the, the, you almost need to double the amount of time for an activity. The uh, first, the first time. time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a great point, Tina. Absolutely. The first time you do anything, it takes longer. And the and point of these, I hope you guys know, is not for you to finish them. Like, I've tried mm -hmm. to make it to where it's impossible for you to finish in the time that I give you. Yeah. <laughs> so that you're not just kind of sitting there. Who's about to say something? I thought I saw somebody's. But I feel like this is where they start going into their native language, you know, like the, it falls apart when they get confused. Yeah. So some of the things I've done is I've like had them outside the cut. You can like speak English out there to like try to mull it over. But like, how do you handle that? I mean, how did you handle that if that happened in your class trying to do this? This is just, they're writing the word in English. There's nothing else that's going to be in English for this activity because everything that they need is genuinely, it's already provided to them in the target language. Like literally the only thing they're doing is thinking. That's it. They're having to think um, and pick out parts of what they're reading to help give them clues as to what the word could be or what it is that they're trying to find. 
but like if they speak start speaking in english and, and debating it do you just just keep talking to them in spanish or and you just look at them and listen <laughs> so so and part of this is the structure of how you set up your room and the expectations and all that i didn't i didn't have issues with my kids speaking english because that was the culture of our class, that when you walk in this room, the reason you're in here is because you want to speak Spanish. And so while we're here, we're going to speak Spanish together. And then when you go out, you can speak English because you're going to hear it the whole time. Like you're never, and I would ask them, when you leave, how often do you, do you speak this language outside of the room? And they would tell me, most of them, they didn't. And I would say, okay, so what if I told you in, that you're going to speak and become really good at speaking if you only do it 90 minutes every other day? how good are you going to be? And they know that they're not going to be phenomenal, right? And so we talk about, so we've got to maximize this time because we don't have enough time to begin with. So that culture is set. In addition to that, so they know the why behind each activity. But in addition to that, I have a system set up to where it rewards Spanish production. And I use Class Dojo for that to make it visible. Um, whenever we're doing anything in Spanish, they get credit for having spoken. The only way they lose points there's no way to lose for messing up, for making a mistake, for speaking incorrectly. The only way they lose points on dojo is if they speak English and you cannot get those points back. So that's, that's a, that's a built-in part of my culture. I want you to, and the more you speak in Spanish and the more points you get, the more it offsets if you do happen to slip and speak English and get points taken away. Like if you only talk two times and one of those is in English, you're going to have a 50. And Dojo figures that out, like it does the percentages. But if you talk 12 times and only one of those is in English, then your grade is going to be, you know, a 90 something. It does that. So those are different things that I've uh, done. And also in, in, my, in my physical room, not here, <laughs> but in my physical room, I have a, um, a sign on the wall that says Hablamos Español on one side. And then on the other one, it says English is cool or say permite inglés right so when i need them to know that okay we can do a hodgepodge of whatever because this is our 10 percent time then whatever you speak is fine but the minute i flip that over there is no english in the room at all ever even when people come to the door to talk to me to do whatever i'm still thinking i'm brick and mortar i would speak in the target language i wouldn't even break you know with administration i would always speak just spanish and people knew that and honored it. So it has to be a, to me, I call it a sacred space. Like this is our Spanish zone. Um, and we honor that. So I don't know if that helps, Rona, but that's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, I think, again, if you're, if you're a non-native speaker and you, and you give me an out, I'm taking it every time. If I can speak English, I will, because it's comfortable. And I'm, my, my English is here and my, my second language is way down here. And I know I want it to be here, but it's not. It's got to get there, and we've got to teach them that it's okay to not have all the words right now. You know, Cheryl just asked in the chat how practical Class Dojo is when you've got a hundred odd students to keep track of. When do you input the data, and does it take long? It doesn't, because you can do all of them at one time. You can assign groups, um, and you can give points to groups at a time. It's it's not it's not uh, it, it's definitely feasible. Yeah. What is the what is it? In my classroom, I, I use it in my classroom if I can uh, contribute. Sure. Uh, you have to set it up, you have to create your classes. I had six classes and I set up my six classes. You have to enter the name of each of your students in the class, and then I connected with the parents so that mm -hmm. the parent I could post a, a work for the parents to see, mm -hmm. or even some like pictures of the kids interacting in the classroom and telling them what we're learning. Mm -hmm. I, I also use it for um, behavior <laughs> because it gives you that um, uh, that 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 uh, capability. Um, it's and, marketed that way. That's I'm I'm a big proponent of not making behavior public, just yeah, because it, it doesn't make it public. It, it really is about like counting counting the points and you know go on the positive side. Um, so you set up the the the. Uh, what do you want to give points for and and then i will use it for the end of the i don't know uh, six weeks of the, the the grading period to have celebrations you know most of the time but i have used it in elementary school and it was used to document 
you know, part of the behavior, which I've, I don't agree, but that's how it was used. But in, in middle school, I have used it mostly for, you know, give, um, like give points uh, to groups or to individual students that have celebrations at the end of the six weeks. Yeah, it's a great way to make learning visible. And I, it, it's marketed for behavior, and I don't believe in making behavior uh, visible. I just don't, I think that shames kids, and that's not what we want to do. Um, and so I use it only to promote speaking the target language. And it's purely for that. Did you speak? Did you contribute to your group in speaking? And like I said, the only way you lose points for me is if you spoke English. That's it. And then the points go away. And so they can see if they spoke English or if they spoke Spanish. And I use it as a, a, a quiz speaking grade at the end. So it, it counted as a grade for their speaking because it was one way that I kept track of who was talking. And especially when I have like competitions, speaking competitions, and someone wins, like you get extra dojo points for winning because that means that you spoke more. It doesn't make the, the, uh, the individual public in any ways, only the, the part that is exposed to the whole class, which is yes. mostly the pictures, but then the rest is individual, even the texting with the parents and everything can yes. be individually managed. Right, right. I love the part where you can send videos to parents. That's, that's pretty cool. Like you can get a snippet of their kid doing stuff in class and then send it to them. Do you track this during the class then? Like, are you filling out this app while you're in the class teaching? I don't quite understand. Is it something that as they're, when they're broken out into groups, then you're kind of recording whether or not they're speaking in the language or not? Yep. I'm wa brick and mortar, I'm walking through the aisles and yes, I have my phone in my hand because it syncs to your phone too. Um, and I'm just, yeah, tapping kids points and, and putting them on the screen. Yep. Yeah, the phone makes it a very good tool to go around and use it. Uh, and it, re it really is a no-brainer. You just push the button. And I also use it for randomly call people to participate. Yep. Absolutely. And they, love, they love when I project it in the screen and they can see all the little monsters. <laughs> that, that, Those that dojos are pretend. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm moving us on because we're at two o'clock and I want to make sure that we get the most in the, here as possible. We are at, where are we? Current slide. <clears throat> charades. Oh, charades and Pictionary are going to go fast because they're pretty much, everybody knows how to do this. Um, but I do, wanna, I do want us to uh, engage in it just so that you can um, see what it feels like to be on the learner end of it virtually. Um, okay, so with charades, you guys all know how to play charades, right? You take a word or words and you physically act them out and then everybody in the group has to guess what that word is. Um, and to keep it moving, two guesses per um, person, per word. Like if I'm acting out a specific word, you only get two guesses before you're, you're not able to guess. And then whoever guesses the most after, the, uh, you know, a certain amount of time is our new actor or actress. And I say that it's on 314 is what we're using. And I'm trying to go back to that page in my book. The ones that we just uh, finished daily lesson design back to our um, reading. There are nine, let's see, three, eight. There are eight different options that they talk about for ways to instruct. And those are the ones that I wanted us to use for um, charades. This is actually, um, whoever just brought up Clash Dojo, this is actually from my Clash Dojo. Like I pulled this from there. Um, and so I'm gonna show charades looks like in the class for about 15 seconds. And then after that, we're gonna do, uh, the next one, and we're going to do both of them at the same time. It'll make sense in just a moment. It looks like in the classroom setting, and one person is acting the entire time, and um, everybody else is the guesser, and you're guessing from a finite set of terms that we're working on. So for us, we're using direct teaching, demonstration, concept attainment, Socratic method, those things. And you're going to be acting. One person acts it out. The other three are trying to guess what it is. Um, and after a certain amount of time, whoever has the most guesses becomes the next actor. Are y'all ready? 
Wait, which which um which page or which terms are we supposed to use? On my printout, it's page five. Yes. Is it? Yeah. Okay, it's on five. Under, yes. Thank you. Daily lesson plan. It's right after daily yes. lesson design. Okay. Daily lesson design. That's yeah, what it is. Five. Yes. Okay. So we're gonna do this one fast because I know y'all know how to do charades, but I want you to see what it feels like as a student. All right, we're going to our breakout rooms, and we're only gonna be in there for a hot second. So the person whose first name was the last in the alphabet is going to be our actor we're only going to act for about two minutes and then we'll talk dulce talk to us talk to us about your group i walked into one group and i saw eating that was awesome i walked into a group y'all hear me it was it was hilarious too <laughs> we, we really enjoyed it um but it was hard too <laughs> all of us took a turn because we couldn't guess the words I, I think we only guessed one. One was guess, <laughs> and I even made fun of it. I said like, ah, you probably just said it was right, so we feel bad. But it was like, <laughs> wow, like I'm trying to do this, and it's like, no, <laughs> it's not working. But it was a, it was a good game. It was tough. <laughs> yes, it was tough. I, I'm the one who put that. It felt like if I was trying to do AP English words. I saw that. Of, <laughs> not because of the terminology that was advanced, but trying to find gestures that would go with the words that's why i was like wow <laughs> who else engaged who else engaged i know we had three people watching and only one acting so give me i want one more angela. actor <laughs> angela's comment yep so uh, we, Ms. We, cheated, we cheated a little bit, to be honest. We ended up taking turns because one person didn't want to do all the acting. Um, <laughs> but we, we did fairly well, but I think we left the hardest to last and didn't end up doing those. So <laughs> we kind of wimped out in that sense. <laughs> nice. So I acted and it was definitely like a stretch to think really that was some cognitive work there to figure mm -hmm. out, try to relate something that I was doing to something that they would be able to guess, even remotely. And that's the, you just nailed Lorraine why I put that in here because I think we forget that the simplicity of something can be really um, rigorous. Um, with what we're doing with our students. So I can ask you to do charades, which is a piece of cake, but you've got to embody and understand what you're trying to act out. And then I am tricking the rest of you into looking back into your resources. Because I bet you all of you were looking, I bet you all of you were looking back at your notes, trying to figure out what it was being depicted, right? So I'm killing a bunch of birds with one stone with such a simple, simple strategy that we, we tend to say, oh, this is for kids, this is a kid's game. No, this is cognitive stretching. It's really hard to um, act something out and get someone to guess what you're doing. And you have to totally understand it. Any other thoughts? Um, yes. Sandy here. We were discussing a little bit in our group how the difference between the activities that are for communication and the activities that are for engagement. Yes. Where it's difficult sometimes to get this, um, and we felt that I felt like what my students might feel sometimes, that it's difficult to get the students engaged sometimes when they feel like it's an activity for the activity sake. Yes. And it, it had been, at least I had been feeling like a little bit like that for the some of the activities mm -hmm. where it's not something that the students are actually going to do mm -hmm. outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So many times it just makes me reflect on like yep. to make it for them to, to realize that this is not just because I want them to practice and I thought it was right. Fun. Right. It's the why, right? It's the why behind. I love that you brought that up because that matters for everything. So if I'm getting you to practice a, a concept, why? Like this is leading up to what? Like it needs to, and, and because uh, kids aren't really good at um, long-term, you know, waiting for something in the, the distant future, their, their immediate gratification is serious. So it needs to be a payoff pretty soon. So you're learning this real quickly right now so that we'll be able to engage in this in a second. Um, it has to be that quick. Yeah, I love that you brought that up. So where you put which of these things you use and which ones you, you know, decide to infuse, that definitely needs to be a consideration. Is it just to fill time? Are they going to see the point of it? Is it? Does it matter to the kid? I love it. I'd like to add something. I, um, I'm the learning specialist at a school, so I work with a lot of kids with language processing differences. And 
what I like about this is that you have, the actor has to make it multi-sensory, so that helps move into long-term memory. It also is a practice for retrieval, and since you're, in, if you're in a group, you're not only trying to retrieve the word, you're also enacting it, and, and, and I like that, because sometimes with just, like with Jeopardy or some kind of whole class things, the kids with the slower retrieval are just not gonna participate. So this was, um, this was a fun way to do it in a multi-sensory way. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think sometimes, again, we, we sleep on these because they're so simple and they're such a, something that you would, you would see normally in an elementary class. But the cool thing is we don't stop learning that way because we're older. Um, we just get too cool. All right. Um, Pictionary is the exact same thing, except that I would tell you to write on your screen. Um, and so you would do the same thing, except instead of acting, you would have that screen up and we've already done that part of it. So I'm not going to have us engage in that one if you guys are okay with that. Because literally it would be the same thing. You draw the concept, except you're using your screen. Um, and I wanna make sure that we get to as many as we can. I may come back to Pictionary if y'all wanna do that though. Heads up is the next one that we're going to use. So, um, Heads up, no um, gestures are allowed in heads up. It's the complete opposite of charades. So charades is all gestures, heads up is all language. So you can't act anything out. So it is vocabulary building and it's teaching them circumlocution. Um, and so using the same exact words that you just finished acting, you're going to do heads up with that. So your job is to get your partner to figure out what it is you are um, discussing or describing without using that word. That word. And again, I have, um, give me a second, I think I have a three minute video um, of this one. So in, in person, um, I would have the students gener generate a list of their most challenging or easiest or whatever they want. Um, of what we're learning and they can't let anyone see what they're doing and I would have them switch and they would put this on top of their head so that it's generally heads up. So let's say that I'm playing against Tara. I see you, you're on my screen first. So I'm playing with Tara. So I hand Tara my card and she can't look at it. She gets mine and I have her card on top of my head. So she sees what she wrote and she's describing it to me. I see what I wrote and I'm describing it to her. Obviously that doesn't work virtually um, so virtually, you would just, it would just be, you keep your own words and describe it to your partner. So it's not on your head, it's just in front of you. That's the only difference. Okay, so you describe uh, a component of the lesson. Um, the person that's guessing has to guess whatever it is that's being described, and you only get three guesses. So if you're wrong three times, you're, that one goes away, like you can't guess that one. And then you alternate on this one. Um, so this one, you go, it, I, this one, I don't want you to talk for the entire round. It, as it says, I want you to alternate. I'm going to show you what it looks like in, in person. Um, I've done it both ways where you talk for the full time and then the other person talks for the full time and they try to beat how many you got. Um, and I've also done it where they alternate. I like alternating, I think a little better for this one. This is four minutes. I may not let it go the whole time, but I want you to see what it looks like in a classroom. The classroom. Sorry, I thought y'all were here the whole time. Thank you for whoever that was that said something. Just sitting there looking at some kids on the screen. <laughs> okay, so you are going to describe. Do you understand how it goes? You can't high five each other. Yes, you can. You can still high five on the screen. So once you figure, once one person des describes it and the other, someone in the group figures it out, that person high fives and just keep going. So this one, wow. So this one is in fours. This one is in pairs. So we'll have two people going uh, for one and then two people going for the other, but stay in the same room so you guys can kind of see how it goes. Cool. Can I, can I have a, I ask a question? Um, the course. way you do with your students, do I understand correctly that, so if you and I are playing together, that I make my list of vocabulary and then I hand it to you. So I'm guessing words that I already wrote down. Is that right? No, this is if we were doing heads up. So in, I called it heads up because it's like the heads up game where you have the heads, you have something on your head. So mm -hmm. in order for it to be heads up, I had them put their list, their partner's list on their head. Mm 
Got it. So you're looking at the one that you wrote, but because we're virtual, I'm doing the same thing, but virtually you have your own list. Thank you. Cool. All right. And high you know, five. I, yeah. No, I was just, I'm just trying to think here. This is kind of, and maybe I'm, maybe this is what I think. It kind of assumes that, well, one that they practice with these words already, they're not brand new to be able to, since they're not having anything to refer to. Right. And then what happens though too is like, and uh, there's always going to be people like, what do you do if you're your partner and they don't know any of that words? Like they haven't studied, they haven't done anything, and they just don't, they can't play because they don't know the words. Like, I love know. that you brought that up. I love that you brought that up because that's this isn't this isn't a right out of the shoot activity. This isn't what I'm going to do right off the bat. This is after we've we've gone through these. You're comfortable with them. We've done some four clues with them. We've done all kinds of other stuff, and we've even practiced this in like a four group so that you can get some ideas on how to circumlocute. Like you gotta have vocabulary and that's gotta be built up over time. So when you get to the point where you're able to then do it on your own as a pair, you've, you've practiced it a few times already. So this is something like right now, we're in fours. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this in a, off, off the shoot in, a, in a, a, a group of four with one kid talking. I would have them practice a bunch of different ways before I would send them off to, to practice by themselves. It's a great point, yeah. Yeah, so this isn't the beginning of the first time they've seen these words kind of thing, unless you've got native speakers and they know it and they just need, they have language and they just need to be able to pick the word. But if you have non-native speakers who don't have language, they've got to build up to being able to do this. Now, I will say though, they have to be familiar with the vocabulary. They do have access to the list because I'm thinking of the first time that I did this activity with my kids was very early on and we were doing opposites and they were able to do that. Like um, it's not tall and then they could say it's short. It's not fat and they could say thin. It's not whatever, they could say that. So they were able to do it pretty early on with really simple front phrases, but it has to be something that they are set up to be able to describe and, and talk about, yeah. Are we going to get to, um, you said you wanted to show Ed Puzzle, but what about flip fruit is something that I've been really interested in doing and, and working with, because that seems to be every, that's like everybody's mentioning flip grid. Um, so I did my little thing at lunch, but um, are we going to have a chance yeah. to just work with that at all? We're going to have a chance to debrief. It's, it's nothing, that's the thing. It's nothing that you, um, I want to know what people do to use it. Because all I've done is use it as like a listening activity and then like private chat. So look at, that's what we're going to do. So you'll look at what your partner yeah. did and then you'll send them like a private chat based on what they said and what you have in common or whatever. Um, and I want some more ideas. Have, did you see it when you went back? Did you see it? Could you see what other people had posted? Yeah, I mean, I didn't click on it, but I mean, I saw everybody's picture. Like, as, yeah, like they yeah. When you see their picture, like right now, literally, you could go back into it and click on any person and you can hear them talking, whatever okay. they say. And then I have the option then to respond, like I would respond in the same way. It'd be like a video of me talking and responding. So it's like a back, back and forth, back and forth like that. You can do the response as far as I've been able to tell is I've only seen the written response. I haven't. I think you, because I think our, our, our actual, our ASL teacher is the one who showed it to us and it was kind of towards the end of the and we just I just didn't have a chance to play around with it but I know that he has used it as like a back and forth kind of thing video wise uh -huh. for him obviously with the you know with ASL he's, he uses the videos a lot and he really really likes it yeah I, 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 that's why I'm, I'm I'm doing this one legit because I want I want ideas mm -hmm. I have used it, but um, honestly, it has been all the time as a kind of end of unit assessment after we explore a topic of whatever, and then I'm gonna gi I give them like an unknown. So a lot of the words or the language that we studied, uh, they know, but they don't know the unknown. So say that we're talking about, I don't know, health, um, health and fitness, and then I suddenly give them a scenario, and then they can't prepare the answer. And then I use it as a way of uh, evaluate an assessment, essentially. What did they learn? Um, there's an unknown portion because, again, in our district, they want it to be proficiency-based versus uh, performance. And so, therefore, they have practiced many of these languages that what they haven't practiced is a scenario. And then I use that um, to 
you, you could use it in many ways. Um, I used it essentially to assess what I do, and then I could do a personalized feedback either by a video or by writing. I'm curious. Yeah. Soy Monica Mitre, enseño español. Eh, antes eran eh, por muchos años español 4 y 5. Este año ya me voy a cambiar al 3 y 3 pre, pre y a 1. Enseño en Austin, Texas, en, en Eastern High School. Una cosa que he descubierto es que no me gusta, <ríe> eh, no me gusta esto. Yo creo que como todo el mundo, um, extraño mucho estar en mi salón. Eh, encuentro muy difícil crear el mismo, es imposible crear el mismo ambiente uh -huh. en un salón. Uh -huh. um, no sé cómo voy a hacer eh, empezando un, con alumnos que no conozco. Eh, sin embargo, eh, voy a escoger eh, un par de, de cosas de tecnología que puedo usar. Eh, y, y nada, hacer lo mejor que pueda y así es lo único que puedo hacer. Leave it doing its thing back there. Um, I, let me see. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. beautiful. I want to make sure that I hit the things that are important um, and relevant for what you want to. So I want to make sure that we pause um, and do that. And I'm looking at the time and we've got about 30 minutes, uh, 25 minutes. And so I know Flipgrid was one of the ones that's important. So um, I do want to make sure that we honor and do that. So I just pulled up the Flipgrid you guys saw. And Monica, thank you uh, for allowing me to do that, even though you didn't allow me to. <laughs> just Put you on put it on the spot but i want to know how people use your flipgrid um i've used it a lot um uh, for many years but i've also used it for a pen pal project okay so i think a lot of us use it for interpersonal conversations we can get little duos or the easy way to get the kids to do videos but it's also a way we can safely and kind of anonymously do pen pal with mm. another culture because it's it's a little time consuming on the front end you have to set up um flips that are only accessible to the kids you're pairing uh, but nicely you can just print out the qr code and hand it to the kid and keep a copy your, for yourself so all they have to do is press on it you know with their phone and pull up their grid Oh. Once you get the time consuming part, you know, find your partner, get the permission slips. Okay. Get parents on board with you, make your pairings. It's a really cool way, and it's a natural way that they talk to each other anyway by chatting and sending videos back and forth. And, and for, uh, we don't have to worry so much about um, the time between the different schools. And I've also done it where. My kids are speaking in French to them. Their kids are speaking in English to us, vice versa. You agree, like I work with the partner teacher and we decide what our themes are gonna be and which what way they're gonna do it. One year we did Thanksgiving because her kids wanted to know about Thanksgiving. Wow. I have a lot of internationals in Houston. So I had them kind of break up in little groups and the internationals who didn't really celebrate would say, okay, well, we're from here, here and here and we don't do it. So this is what we do. and so you can have them do group videos to their pen pals. Um, I've had my AP classes be responsible for doing like the school video, introducing the entire school because they're, oh, wow. they're easier to kind of send out into the world without worrying about what they're doing. <laughs> and then they'll produce a video. Um, the other thing I've had them do with this pen pal exchange is that the, the pen pal is the end viewer of a product video that they can upload. So when I've had them do like restaurant reviews mm -hmm. and I've and the pen pal class has been the end user of these reviews. And then I could set up a um, Google forms survey to get some feedback about like what restaurants would they want to go eat at and which video did they think was the best. And so you know, I like that this project on my level, but then they have an end user telling them, okay, 
I want to go to this restaurant, but that video was really awesome. And so there's lots of ways you can use it as a pen pal, keeping the anonymity because they're not exchanging anything but first names. And you have to do all of the FERPA stuff and keep it really closed down. Nobody can get into it except for me, the pen pal teacher, and the pen pals. And that code is capped between us. Um, it's moderated, so it's really shut down. Yeah. Don't open it until you see that it's okay to send to the other. But once when you do that, the kids, even my not particularly high performing kids are like, when are we going to get another video from our pen pals? And yeah, making it real. Making Yeah, and also feeling like um, even if I would notice that kids who are pretty good, but they kind of casually do everything, they kind of do it as quickly as possible to get it over with. But if they would just push one extra level, you could see that this could be a real linguist that you have sitting there. And then because the end user is some charming person in France or wherever, they're, they're upping their game because right. I'm not the audience. Anymore. Right. That makes sense. So there's so many wonderful things you can do on the pen pal level. It's complicated to set up once you get it set up and you have a good pen pal group that you like, and you work well together. It's really cool for the kids back and forth. And it's a safe way to, to do that. Them. So, yeah. And uh, I would have what I, what I was going to do with you guys is literally base level because I that's this is what I need um, was to have you look for your partner's pen pal, um, pen pal, look for your partner's flip grid and watch what they had to say and then have like a private chat conversation with them based on what you heard them say. Um, that's that's my level of, of, of use in so far, but I love the pen pal idea. I'm taking that. Any other uh, suggestions on how you guys use Flipgrid? Because it was one of the things lots of people said they used. Um, I went, oh, Nina, I, mm -hmm. used, I used Flipgrid this past um, uh, nine weeks online and it was a, a, an assessment and I provided the rubric oh. for them they had to call up their friend on their cell phone. So they're videotaping themselves from Flipgrid and they're, as they're recording themselves. And basically they just invited a friend to lunch. They provided them two dates in case they couldn't make the first one. So they identified themselves. Hi, this is Norma. Hey, Charlie, what are you doing on Saturday? Would you like to go with me to the mall at 6.30 or 7.30? All right, give me a call back, bye. And so they videotape themselves on their cell phone because you know they they don't they they they're everywhere with a cell phone. They never leave it, put their cell phone down. So it was a perfect way to uh, model the language, the vocabulary, and meet the rubric. Sweet, I like it. I like it. Okay, so the sky is the limit again, and I'm going to be playing with this. This is one of the tools that I'm committed to trying to play with this uh, year. Um, and find more uses for. So I love the idea of back and forth. I hadn't set up individual ones. That's something that I'm definitely going to look into. Instead of having one big, huge flip grid for an entire class, having paired flip grids where it's just in between two people. I really like those approaches. So I'll be using that. You guys are welcome to go back to this one and you can see everyone from our class who's inputted um, their flip grids and what they said. Um, about themselves. I do want you guys to um, know about Vokey. Vokey is really interesting because it's, uh, and this is a workaround that um, we found because of COVID. My students really, really, really liked Vokey because, and when I say my students, it's a paid app, um, but they have free a free trial. And so I've been using the free, the free version of it because of, um, Zoom, because I'm able to record from Zoom, I don't need to necessarily go the extra part and, and do anything uh, to do what I needed to do with it for my students. So Vokey allows students to be able to talk or it can read what's been written um, and they don't have to use their faces. They use an avatar that they get to create. So uh, if you're going to use Vokey with kids, I would suggest giving this to them to do on their own time because it's a time sucker because they'll start having fun with it and they won't want to um, stop playing with it to do the other parts. Okay, so this is a quick uh, one minute blurb about Vokey with me using Vokey. 
the sound is interesting because I called in from my phone. So I wanted you to see what it sounded like from the phone, but you can do it directly into the computer or you can type in a message and Voki itself will read for you. So this is what, it, this is my avatar that I created. right there right here when you click on this little boy he gives you a plethora of ethnicities and genders to choose from so you don't have to just have some one image it could be anybody and, and there are also celebrities in there so you'll see George Washington and you'll see Barack Obama um, here you get to choose what outfit you want them to wear here you get to choose what background you want them to have and then here you get to choose the colors of those backgrounds. And then here you get to decide how you want it to be um, verbalized by Voki. So you can decide if you want it to be verbalized with um, your voice, or if you want to write something in a panel in the target language and then have it speak. You can also choose where you want it to speak from. So if I want someone from Argentina, because I want to hear that uh, accent, I can choose Argentina. If I want someone from Costa Rica, I can choose Costa Rica. And it has tons of different, it has lots of languages. I taught, um, I'm trying to think which language wasn't in there. Almost, there were at least 30 languages uh, registered in Voki that you could choose from. The most, the most um, typical and common ones are in there. And then there's lots of less commonly spoken languages in there as well. So it's a tool that I would strongly, strongly, strongly suggest playing around with. And all I did was record this from Zoom. So I clicked record and I had, you know, called in my Voki, did my Voki, and then I stopped. So I was able to record what I did. Otherwise, it goes away once you close the screen if you don't have the paid version. So what I wanted to do is um, pause and give you about four or five minutes offline to just kind of look at it and form any questions that we can talk about together. So I want you to actually like, tab. sorry, I should be talking in the mic right now. I would like for you to pull up another tab um, and play with Voki for about five minutes and then come back and let's talk about what you saw. Now, you can get lost with Voki because there's so much to it and there's so many elements and it's so many layers and that's what we want your students to do we want them to get lost with it and then they start producing language um, and it gives you an opportunity to either hear them or it gives you an opportunity to have them write something and have an avatar produce it so you have no faces so we don't have to worry about FERPA at all when it comes to Voki. Um, and it's one of the things that I like about it. Any comments or questions in about a minute before we move from Voki? I just wanted to give you a chance to get in it, to make you want to get in it. You uh, talked yeah. about the workarounds, Nina, and do you have the students do the same thing or do you have them sign up for the free account or do you just have them record from their screen? Just have them record from their screen now because, I mean, there's no point in doing extra stuff if we don't have to. Right, okay, great, thanks. Um, what if, um, I, I'm not sure I understand the Voki yet. I was trying to watch the introductory videos. So do you type something and the avatar speaks it or do you speak something and then the avatar speaks it for you? Both. That's the beauty of Voki. Can you, you can, can do you, either one. You choose. Can you set it to where they have to do one or the other? You can, you can set your expectations for what, they're, what you tell them to do and your instructions. Okay, but, uh, but I couldn't actually control what they're, <laughs> they're typing it or saying it. You can see it. Yeah, because if it's if it's spoken that um, text stays in that box and it, it just talks it while it's sitting right there on the side of the box. And if it's if they spoke it, then there wouldn't be text. To right. It. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Nina, would you use this for assessment? Can you use it for assessment? Because my guess with this is that the children will be reading their answers versus producing the language spontaneously. 
They don't necessarily have to be reading the language. You can push them out into a breakout room after they've had a chance to experience, you know, how to get to it quickly and what to do and have them do, give them a time limit and bring them back so that you know that they're actually producing it and not just reading something. It oh, okay. can be spontaneous. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know what, Nina, I was going to ask, how different is it from Flipgrid? But Flipgrid doesn't, does Flipgrid have a uh, breakout session or class? Uh, this, to me, it's, it's on a whole different level from Flipgrid because you are able to do so much more with it. When you start playing around with all the layers and all the features, you'll start uncovering how much more. And um, it's not like, it's not your face at all. So it would be worth if your school could purchase it for you? I mean, you know, out of your department funds? I would say play with it and make that determination. Yeah, play with it and make that determination. All right, so I'm looking at the time. It's 2.55, and I want to honor y'all's time. I'm not going to keep you longer. Um, Fly Swatter Game, and I'm going to put a link for Edpuzzle. It's like Voki and any other uh, tech tool. Um, you, it's It's... What Edpuzzle is, is you can pull from any video anywhere, YouTube, anything that you have on your computer, any video from anywhere, you throw it in Edpuzzle and it allows you to stop it and put questions in there, interactive things that the students do, um, and it, you can even use it as an assessment. So that's what Edpuzzle is. Um, and I'm going to throw in the chat for you to um, look at on your, at your leisure. You can pull this out at any time. Um, well, you have to pull it out before no. we go, but you can look at it at any time. Um, the one that I have prepared for us, that's the Ed Puzzle that I have for us. But I do want to honor that um, there was someone who wanted to do um, Floss Water Game online because that's something that we all, uh, almost everybody I know who teaches languages uses. So also when we- a good, real quick, I'm yeah. sorry. Real quick no. on the Ed Puzzle, there's tons of them already made. Yes, thank you for saying that, Monica. That was worth saying. Definitely. You don't have to go recreate the wheel. Okay. With Mata Moscas or Flash Water Game, um, the way you, it, well, y'all know how you play it. I'm going to tell you how I play it. I play it so that it's, it's all target language. So we use the same words that we would have used before. So we would have used like um, the direct teach or um, demonstration, concept attainment, all those things that we've been using. Those same phrases, I would have you let me stop. You would go into a breakout room and what you would do is share your screen. And the way you would share your screen is you would share a whiteboard instead of just your regular screen. And all of you would, can y'all see my screen like what I'm doing right now? Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So what you would do is select text and then pick a place on your screen, a place here, and then uh, a place there and then you put your um, they you have the students write whatever word they're going to have on the screen and then you have them select uh, where is it draw where did it go I know I want format because format is important because they all need a different color there it is it's uh, draw there it is so draw I'm gonna pick the the square and then format, I choose what color I am. And whoever is playing Floss Water Game with me, one person is going to describe or circumlocute whatever is on the screen. And then whoever encircles the right word first wins that round. And then I can just undo it. And you can tell who the winner is by who puts their, their square around it first. Did that make sense? You know, I someone see. was asking if this was in Zoom, but the, the whiteboard tool is from Zoom, right? Yeah, this whiteboard tool is from Zoom. And Zoom is, I mean, Zoom is, I don't know if schools are allowing everybody to use Zoom, but that's the one that we've all been been using. But yeah, this is a whiteboard feature in Zoom. I know the same feature. Where is, is that just on that main board? This where, is where just, is, it, it is a part of when I share my whiteboard, it pops up. It's It's the... How do you get to whiteboard though? Just, when you oh, by share, the way, I see, okay. Yeah, the minute you share your screen, you have the option to pull up that whiteboard. And so that's okay. there and the kids can, they can okay. circumlocute. So I'm describing the word in Spanish. I'm describing, describing, and the, my, my group members are trying to be the first one too. And whatever you land on first, that's what you get. Um, and then we play rounds of two out of three. And then the, whoever won two out of three, they get to describe the next part. 
So you can do this even just with uh, basic vocabulary words too. Uh huh. You can do so this with anything. You can throw pictures in there. You can throw whatever you want in there and play fast rod game with it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. That is, I think that's our time. It is 2.59 and you guys have been with us this whole time and engaged and I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the sharing. Um, the one ask that I have before you go is you would tell me what one thing are you taking back? What is one thing that you're taking back? And Sarah just dropped a survey link in there, but I want to know what one thing you're taking back. And thank y'all. Thank y'all for being here. And if you have any questions about any of the stuff and any of the things, um, let me know. I'm always here and um, I love talking to teachers because as much as uh, you give, um, you also get. So thank you. Okay, thank you for everything. Thank, thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you for hanging out for an entire day on Zoom. <laughs>